We're going to get started in, in the next minute. So if you can find your seats. Buenas tardes, New Yorkinos. I'm Carlos Menchaca, chair of the New York City Council's Committee on Immigration. And I would like to recognize the members of our committee who are here today, right now, and uh, want to welcome Councilmember Holden from Queens. This is our last immigration hearing for the year, and it's allowing us to actually take stock of where we've come and where we will continue to go as we fight for the rights of our immigrant families. You know, specifically, our committee today will focus on ways in which the need for legal representation in immigration court has changed since the inauguration of President Trump. Since the beginning of the presidential campaign, Trump has made aggressive immigration enforcement a policy priority. Since his inauguration, they did not waste time. Trump and the new White House team have exposed their true nature through proposing xenophobic, Islamophobic measures that we knew, that we know, are designed to fuel white supremacy policies. He has used every tool at his disposal, executive orders, rulemaking, and agency guidance to radically change the immigration landscape in this country with the focus of removing, through deportation and detention, our black and brown immigrant neighbors. Trump wants a whiter America, an America that is ethnically cleansed. And this reality has shaken us to our core. I feel this personally as a proud Mexican-American who grew up on the border in El Paso, Texas, that watched the militarization of a wall and as a gay man, this administration has made every attempt to strip protections of the LGBTQ gender nonconforming community as well. In fact, we are all, all feeling these changes on a personal level. And we will begin uh, today by hearing from members of our community about their experiences under this administration. It was almost two years ago that a rushed executive order led to what is now known as a travel ban. And many of you outraged, protested, organized that protest against the cruel and ill-conceived policy at JFK and across the country at other airports. Because of the court challenges and the public outrage at this, at this Islamophobic policy, we witnessed the president issue a new executive order tailored to avoid court objections. And we saw it upheld in the courts this last summer. In October 2017, Trump announced the rescission of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, DACA, jeopardizing the futures of more than 700,000 DACA recipients nationwide and at least 30,000 DACA recipients in New York City. Similarly, the Department of Homeland Security under Trump has failed to renew the Temporary Protected Status, TPS, for Sudan, Haiti, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Honduras putting thousands of TPS recipients at risk of falling out of status, many of whom have been in this country, let alone our city and surrounding area for over a decade. In April 2018, with the announcement of a newly implemented zero tolerance policy at the US-Mexico border, we heard of the shocking family separation policy that has been underway since at least October 2017 under Trump. We sat in this same room and heard from the service providers and the mayor's office about the approximately 300 children who were re removed from their parents at the border and sent to foster care agencies here in the city. To this day, it remains unclear if every child has been returned to their parents. And as recently as November 27th, 
ProPublica reported that there are at least 16 new child separation cases in New York City, and the number of unaccompanied minors continues to grow. Simultaneously, we are seeing a rise in immigration enforcement as Trump used executive orders to discard previously established criteria that limited removals. In the first eight months of the Trump administration, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, arrests rose 67%. The number of arrests in, uh, of individuals with no criminal convictions rose by 225%. Not only this, but it is now commonplace for ICE to detain individuals at administrative check-ins, visa interviews, military bases, workplaces, courthouses, and in our own neighborhoods. It breaks my heart every time I hear stories that are coming out and this over-enforcement has become everyday commonplace. And it's that that destabilizes our communities. And so we ask, what are we doing as a city? Most recently, we have, most recently, we have experienced the harmful impacts of the proposed public charge rule. And by expanding the categories of government programs that are grounds for denying a green card or visa, this proposed rule penalizes poor immigrants forcing them to choose between their well-being and being able to stay in this, country, in this country lawfully. This rule proposal has caused mass confusion throughout our city with legal and social service providers reporting a spike in calls from impacted individuals and families asking for simple basic information. As we can see from this brief retrospective, the immigration landscape has shifted radically. The need has grown dramatically, and it outstrips the services that we have. Where we may have previously matched the need under prior administrations, however unevenly, we are now in uncharted waters. How are we, the city of New York, preparing to continue the long battle to protect the rights of our immigrant families? I believe that we, the people, the people of this great city of New York have a moral responsibility to protect due process and the right to counsel of all our neighbors, our immigrant families. Every person must have the opportunity for a fair day in court. And data and research, research show that represented individuals experience exponentially more successful legal outcomes than those without representation. Because individuals with cases in immigration court are not entitled to government-appointed legal representation, those who cannot afford legal counsel may have no way to adequately protect themselves in immigration court proceedings. And they may face serious consequences, such as separation from their families and deportation from their home. This is unacceptable. What is our city doing about this? And that's where our legal service providers come in. They have stepped up to this need and responded with tremendous courage and perseverance against the impossible odds. Many of our legal service providers are here today, and I thank you for being here today. Thank you for the work tirelessly to fight against this federal administration's cruel and discriminatory policies, and I thank you, and I thank you for fighting to keep our communities and families together every single day. Again, going above and beyond. As the policies and the guidance and the executive orders continue to pile up and the legal landscape becomes more crowded and convoluted, the need for legal expertise grows exponentially. And that's why we are here today. We want to explore how the needs of immigration legal services have shifted and how those needs have grown and how we as a city council can continue to support the legal service providers and ensure that all immigrants, all immigrants, all our neighbors have access to representation that they deserve. We look forward to hearing testimony from the administration, advocates, and community members as we better protect our immigrant communities from this indiscriminate and rapidly growing deportation machine. And before we begin with our first public panel, I wanna thank our staff who put this incredible hearing together. Um, and if you haven't read the, the briefing, uh, this briefing reads like a book. I mean, it's a horror story, of course, but it is really important to kind of capture the actual understanding that we have today. And with the new data that we're going to get presented today, I think we're going to have a fuller picture 
of the gap of services. And with that, I want to thank uh, our committee counsel, Harbani Auja, committee policy analyst, Elizabeth Kronk, finance analyst, Jin Lee, and my staff, including my senior advisor, Cesar Vargas, uh, and Sociata Meng, my chief of staff, and communications director, Tony Chiarito. Uh, with that, I also want to welcome uh, Brooklyn council member, uh, Matthew Eugene, and our first panel, oh, you know what, also, we, we have to mention this. Uh, the breaking news, I think all of you have probably received already, uh, but for folks who are listening online, just moments ago, news broke that a federal judge struck down Donald Trump's policies that were designed to ban victims of domestic violence or gang violence from seeking asylum. Our courts are working. Uh, U.S. District Judge Sullivan ruled that the Trump policies were unlawful. He also ordered that the administration he, he, also, he, he ordered uh, the administration to return to the U.S. asylum seekers who were unlawfully deported under the policy. So we're going to be welcoming back those who have been deported. This is a major victory that could help uh, Sarah and Henry, two of my Sunset Park constituents who came here from Honduras, escaping, escaping awful gang violence. This legal win, however, comes with challenges as these vulnerable groups of immigrants, mostly women and children, from Central America who are seeking asylum under these grounds will now be in dire need of legal representation. Hence our hearing today. And uh, I'm, gonna hold, I'm gonna bring the first panel, uh, Axel Henry from Safe Passage Project, if you can please come on up, uh, and Samantha, Norris from the Safe Passage Project. This is our first public panel. And is there a Christine Johnson in the room? Okay, thank you. And actually, you can start. Um, make sure the, the light is on, the red light. Thank you. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Gracias a todos y a todos por estar aquí y escucharme esta tarde. Good afternoon. Thank you to everyone for being here and listening to me this afternoon. Mi nombre es Axel Rolando Harry Herrera. My name is Axel Rolando Harry Herrera. Tengo 19 años. I am 19 years old. Vengo de Honduras de la Lima Cortés. I am from Honduras, from La Lima Cortés. Actualmente vivo aquí en Nueva York, en el Bronx. I currently live here in New York, in the Bronx. En junio, me gradué de Harlem Renaissance High School. In June, I graduated from Harlem Renaissance High School. Y ahora estudio en Godman Community College. Estudio los servicios humanos para poder seguir con mi carrera de ser trabajador social. Now I study in Gutman Community College. I study human services to be able to continue my goal of becoming a social worker. Me vine a los Estados Unidos en el 2013. Decidí emigrar de mi país porque allá hay mucha delincuencia y hay menos probabilidades de salir adelante. I came to the United States in 2013. I decided to emigrate from my country because there is a lot of delinquency there and less chance of getting ahead. También tenía mi mamá aquí en los Estados Unidos. Quería reunirme con ella porque ya tenía siete años de no verla. Also, I had my mother here in the U.S. I wanted to reunite with her because it had been seven years since I last saw her. Cuando yo vine, yo tenía 14 años. No fue fácil separarme de mis abuelos y tomar la decisión de irme, pero sabía que el viaje era muy arriesgado, pero mi mayor motivación era salir adelante y ver a mi mamá. When I came, I was 14 years old. It wasn't easy to separate from my grandparents and make the decision to leave because I knew that the trip was dangerous, but my biggest motivation was to get ahead and see my mom. Mi primer sueño era ser actor y tener la oportunidad de estar en un teatro y estar en una película donde podría actuar, cantar y bailar a la misma vez. My first dream was to be an actor and have the opportunity to be in the theater and to be in a movie where I could act, sing and dance at the same time. Después con el tiempo fui descubriendo otras motivaciones que fue trabajador social porque me gusta comunicarme y ayudar a las demás personas. Then with time, I discovered other motivations to be a social worker because I like to communicate with and help people. Así como me ayudaron a mí. Just like they helped me. En agosto del 2014, mi mamá y yo contactamos al programa Pasaje Seguro. In August of 2014, my mom and I contacted Safe Passage Project. Fuimos a la oficina y me entrevistaron. 
We went to the office and they interviewed me. Un tiempo después me llamaron para comunicarme que encontraron una abogada interesada en mi caso. Afterwards, they called me to tell me that they found a lawyer who was interested in my case. Me sentí alegre, pero también me sentía nervioso porque sabía que iba a tener que contar mi historia. Había momentos que eran muy difíciles para mí expresarme porque había un pasado cosas dolorosas en mi niñez. I felt happy, but I also felt nervous because I knew that I was going to have to tell my story. There were moments that were really hard to express myself because a lot of hurtful things had happened in my childhood. Pero con el tiempo establecí una relación de confianza con mi abogada y me hizo sentir cómodo. But with time, I established a trustful relationship with my lawyer and she made me feel comfortable. Me sentía con más seguridad en la corte. Mi abogada aprendí a sentirme más seguro de mí mismo al contar mi experiencia y responder a las preguntas que me hacían. I felt more secure in court. With my lawyer, I learned to feel more confident in myself to tell my experience and respond to the questions they asked me. Más que darme una abogada, Pasaje Seguro me dio otras oportunidades de conocer a más jóvenes como yo, inmigrantes que emigraron a Estados Unidos y conocer sus historias. More than giving me a lawyer, Safe Passage gave me other opportunities to know more youth like me who immigrated to the United States and know their stories. Cuatro años después de mi primera entrevista en Pasaje Seguro, recibí una llamada de ellos diciéndome que ya habían aceptado mi aplicación para la residencia permanente. Me sentí muy alegre porque allí me di cuenta que todos mis esfuerzos de venir aquí habían valido la pena. Four years after my first interview with Safe Passage, I received a call from them telling me that immigration had accepted my application for permanent residency. I felt very happy because then I realized that all of my efforts to come here were worth it. Ser inmigrante sin documentos no es fácil. Uno, se siente, uno no se siente parte de los Estados Unidos. A veces yo caminaba con miedo que me podrían regresar a mi país. Being an immigrant without documents is not easy. One doesn't feel part of the United States. Sometimes I walked in fear that I could be returned to my country. Pero más que todo pensaba en mi abuela y la posibilidad de no poder volverla a ver. But more than anything, I thought about my grandma and the possibility of never being able to go back and see her. Cuando recibí esa llamada, recuerdo que lloré de la felicidad. When I received that call, I remember that I cried from the happiness. Ahora con mi residencia, tengo más motivaciones para seguir adelante y superarme. Lo que pensaba que era una ilusión, ahora es realidad. Now with my residency, I have more motivation to get ahead and excel. What I thought was an illusion is now a reality. Todo esto es gracias al programa Pasaje Seguro por haberme ayudado todo este tiempo en mi proceso migratorio y ayudarme a poder lograr mis sueños. All of this is thanks to Safe Passage for having helped me all of this time in my immigration process and helping me achieve my dreams. Gracias por escucharme hoy. Thank you for listening to me today. Muchas gracias, Axel, por la historia que el testimonio que diste hasta ahora es algo uh, que me inspira a mí para trabajar más, más duro como concejal. Um, pero la historia uh, está lleno de amor de, de familia y eso estamos hablando ahora de, de cómo conectar y seguir conectando familia eso es el más grande uh, posibilidad cre creando posibilidad para, para este mundo si tenemos ese amor um, fuerte uh, uh, una pregunta sobre el, la conexión de, de tu, es tu caso y a otros que vienen a Safe Passage y, y hablando con ellos, otros, otros jóvenes que no tienen esa confianza que para, para conectar a, a servicios así, ¿qué, qué, es tu, qué, qué haces por ellos, otros, otros jóvenes que vienen a, a Safe Passage? Bueno, yo les diría que sí contactaran el pasaje seguro porque más que todo de darte una abogada te hacen sentir en familia te ayudan, no solo te hacen sentir que están trabajando contigo, en verdad estableces una comunicación y una relación familiar con ellos. El abogado. Con la abogada. Awesome. Uh, I just, I asked a little bit about, um, I don't know if you want to translate, but I, I asked a little bit about, um, or commented on, on the fact that the testimony really focused on love for family, and that this is all what we're talking about, how to, how to, how to bring families together, uh, and that kind of bond of love makes makes the world better, it, it forces us to, to be a better better world. And, and that's at the core, I think, of what we're trying to do here. And what, what work does he do with young people that come to Safe Passage that might not be so confident to come and talk to a lawyer? 
and, and I think his story is one that talks about lawyers doing a lot of the work to bring people in and make you feel like family. And, and that's, that's beautiful. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Okay. De nada. We're going to move on to the administration. And thank you for being here today. We are, uh, oh, and before I do that, we have Councilmember Joni from the Bronx here and Councilmember Yeager from Brooklyn. Thank you so much for being here today. So we can have Commissioner uh, Steve Banks and Commissioner B Tim Mustafi. We're gonna swear you in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member, council member questions? Yes. Yes, thank you. You may begin. Thank you to Chairman Chaka and members of the Committee on Immigration. My name is Vita Mustofi. I'm the Commissioner for the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. I'm joined today by Commissioner Stephen Banks, who will testify about the Department of Social Services, Human Resources Administration's Immigration Legal Services programs. Thank you very much for calling a hearing on this crucial issue. The Mayor and the City Council have made historic investments to promote access to justice for immigrant residents. With these investments and in collaboration with other city agencies, legal service providers, and community partners, Moya and HRA's Office of Civil Justice have worked to address the legal needs of immigrant New Yorkers at a time of, of acute crisis. As the Trump administration continues to attack immigrants on all fronts, New York City's investment in immigration legal services, which is the largest municipal investment in our country's history, stands in stark and proud contrast on the side of immigrant rights. While today's hearing is about legal representation in immigration court, we as a city have recognized that the need for immigration legal services extends beyond immigrants facing deportation. It is also critical to provide representation for immigrants filing family-based applications, applying for citizenship, or seeking affirmative humanitarian relief. This is not only because a change in status can provide an avenue to new economic and civic opportunities, but also because naturalization and regularization of immigration status can prevent deportation and protect families from being ripped apart. In today's testimony, I will speak briefly about the need for immigration legal services in a hostile federal climate, discuss the city's response, and give an overview of the success of Moya's immigration legal services programs. In this second year of the Trump administration, we have seen an assault on our immigrant communities and on the immigration system as a whole. Our analyses of the latest ICE data shows that the Trump administration ramped up its overbroad immigration enforcement actions in 2018. Total civil immigration arrests in the New York City area are 88% higher over the last federal fiscal year than in the last year of the Obama administration. Even more shocking, arrests of individuals in the New York City area with no criminal conviction whatsoever is now 414% higher than in the last year of the Obama administration. Moreover, through a set of regulatory actions, the Trump administration has made it making it more, even more complex and risky for immigrants to apply for immigration benefits. With high processing times at US Citizenship and Immigration Services and an ever-growing backlog in the immigration courts, the federal government's actions have highlighted the fact that our immigration system is indeed broken. Legal services are crucial for immigrants, but there is no right to appointed counsel funded by the federal government for immigrants, detained or non-detained, in immigration court. Instead, the lion's share of immigration legal services provided in New York City today is funded through the historical investments of Mayor de Blasio and the City Council. Access to high quality, trusted immigration legal services can be the difference between becoming a citizen and languishing in detention. Immigrants who do not have access to immigration legal services are particularly vulnerable to exploitation and to fraud. In response to these challenges, the de Blasio administration and the City Council have invested historic amounts these investments and the hard work of our legal service providers and community-based organizations and partners, many of whom are here today, are what make New York City a model for other cities across the nation. 
Given the scope of the administration's attacks on immigrants, the de Blasio administration and city council have focused on funding the provision of a wide spectrum of services, which allows us to respond quickly to the ever-shifting federal landscape. The investments of the administration and the council work hand in hand in addressing some of the deep problems plaguing our immigration system. In fiscal year 2018, the de Blasio administration and the council dedicated $48 million in funding, with about 30 million as baseline funding from the, from the administration to a continuum of free legal services programs for immigrant New Yorkers. Our funding supports the provision of crucial and timely information about immigrants' rights, support for affirmative applications to adjust immigration status or naturalize, and legal representation to defend against deportation. This includes city programs like Action NYC, the Immigrant Opportunities Initiative, and Federal Community Services Block Granted Fund Services at HRA, as well as council-funded programs like NIFEP, the Unaccompanied Minors Initiative, Immigrant Child Advocates Relief Effort, and others. This funding structure provides great flexibility for the city to respond to the new needs. For example, and as Commissioner Banks will testify, the IOI program's contracting model allows for rapid deployment of staff and resources to address a continuum of these legal needs, from brief legal counseling to full representation in removal and asylum cases. Of course, the city and the council are not the only funders for immigration legal services. In coordination with the Mayor's Fund to Advance New York City and other sister agencies, Moya has engaged, engaged extensively with private funders to support additional resources for our community partners and to help address any gaps. Turning to Moya's work in this area, Moya plays a critical role in the provision of immigration legal services in the city. We engage with providers, review data, monitor shifts in immigration policy to inform the city investments, and ensure that resources are being allocated to respond to urgent needs. It is in this role that Moya is able to provide guidance to and work in partnership with our sister agencies as we survey the immigration legal landscape. As an example, in the wake of the family separation crises, Moya worked closely with DSS, HRA's OCJ, to identify further legal services needs for separated and the children and their families. In response, the city announced an allocation of $4.1 million to provide assistance for migrant children, including both unaccompanied minors and separated children in our city. Moya also operates two immigration legal services programs in partnership with HRA, Action NYC and NY Citizenship. Action NYC is a citywide community-based immigration legal services program that provides access to legal services for residents, as well as resources for providers to grow the immigration services field. Immigrant New Yorkers receive free, safe, and high-quality immigration legal services in their community and in their language. Through its citywide hotline, centralized appointment-making system, and accessible service locations at CBOs, in schools, and hospitals, Action NYC serves as an entry point for New Yorkers seeking immigration legal services. For those who need straightforward legal help, these providers provide full legal representation in these matters, including but not limited to citizenship applications, green card renewals, and TPS renewals. When capacity permits, they provide full representation in complex cases, such as special immigrant juvenile status and U visas. For legal cases outside the team's scope of services or capacity, Action NYC connects clients to the city-funded programs, such as IOI. Moya also provides connections to Action NYC through outreach and Know Your Rights programming. Responding to the need for immigration legal services among New York City's hard-to-reach immigrant populations, Earlier this year, Action NYC selected six additional CBOs to provide services to underserved groups. Action NYC has also increased local providers' ability to provide high-quality legal services through a capacity-building fellowship started last year in partnership with the Office of Economic Opportunity. Demand for Action NYC services has remained consistently high throughout the life of the program, including in fiscal year 2018. In 2018, Action NYC providers screened about 8,600 clients at community-based sites, schools, and hospitals. Of those clients, we found that the majority had straightforward cases, about a tenth of all cases were complex, and about a quarter of screen clients had no relief available. 
In fiscal year 18, Action NYC opened 5,600 cases and filed more than 3,200 applications. New York Citizenship provides free citizenship application assistance, including screenings and full legal representation, as well as financial empowerment services. Moya operates NY Citizenship in partner partnership with the Brooklyn, Queens, and New York Public Library Systems, DSS HRA, New York Legal Assistance Group, and the Mayor's Fund to Advance New York City. In FY18, NY Citizenship provided services at 12 public library branches across all five boroughs. Through a partnership with DSS HRA, the program also offered services to vulnerable populations, including seniors and those facing health barriers, such as disability. In total, in, in 2018, New York Citizenship provided legal screenings for about 1,700 immigrant New Yorkers. As I have described, it is crucial to recognize that the need for legal representation for immigrants stretches from removal proceedings to assistance with naturalization applications. Across this entire swath of need, Moya has consistently provided important policy guidance and leadership for the administration. Moya works to identify needs and trends based on changes in federal, federal law and practice, and we are committed to continuing to do so. My colleague, Commissioner Banks, will speak to the Office of Civil Justice's important work administering additional immigration legal services programs, including the Immigrant Opportunities Initiative and the Council's Crucial Initiatives. I want to thank Chairman Chaka for calling this important hearing. I also want to thank the legal service providers and community-based organizations, our partners truly, in the fight against cruel and draconian federal immigration policies for the extraordinary work that you do day in and day out to protect immigrant New Yorkers. Simply put, this work would be impossible without the partners in the field, many of whom are here today. The Trump administration's continuous attacks on our immigrant communities have created a deep and enduring need for immigration legal services. Both the Council and Mayor de Blasio have stepped up to help meet this need, and we look forward to working together with our partners in the community and other stakeholders to provide further resources for immigrant New Yorkers. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Chairman Chaka and members of the Immigration Committee for giving us this opportunity to testify today. My name is Stephen Banks. I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Social Services, which oversees Human Resources Administration, HRA, and the Department of Homeless Services, DHS. I'd like to thank my colleague, Commissioner Mustafi, and the Mayor's Office for Immigrant Affairs uh, for uh, their partnership in this essential work uh, that this administration has undertaken to provide legal services to immigrant uh, uh, New Yorkers. Uh, before uh, proceeding with the testimony for this hearing, I'd just like to uh, restate my remarks uh, from uh, testimony that I gave Monday uh, before the General Welfare Committee to address the extremely uh, troubling incident at one of our Brooklyn client locations which culminated in the arrest of an HRA client. What happened at the Human Resources Administration's DeKalb Center on Friday, uh, December 7th, was completely unacceptable uh, and should never happen again in New York City. On behalf of our agency and our dedicated frontline staff in all five boroughs, I apologize to Jasmine Headley and her one-year-old son and to the people of the city of New York for the actions that were taken that day. As reflected in the NYPD body-worn camera videos, there were multiple points at which this incident could have and should have been disfused. Last Monday, I placed uh, two HRA peace officers on modified duty with no client contact. Consistent with their collective bargaining agreement uh, last Friday, I suspended these two officers without pay for the maximum period of time, and DSS will file disciplinary charges against them that could result in termination. Going forward, unless there is an immediate safety threat, I am directing that HRA peace officers shall not request the intervention of the NYPD without first contacting a center director or deputy director or his or her designee to attempt to defuse the situation by addressing a client need. Within the next 90 days, DSS will conduct retraining sessions for all HRA peace officers with an emphasis on techniques for de-escalating disputes in HRA centers. Thereafter, this enhanced training will be a mandatory annual requirement for each officer. I intend to attend each of these retraining sessions to speak to the HRA peace officers about uh, the importance of de-escalating disputes. 
DSS has directed the city's contracted security services vendor to provide retraining sessions for all security guards assigned to HRA centers with an emphasis on techniques for de-escalating disputes at HRA centers. Thereafter, this training will be mandatory annual requirement for any contracted security officer assigned to an HRA office. In addition to existing DSS customer service staff training, DSS has requested and received OMB funding commitment to develop implicit bias training for all 17,000 DSS staff members to promote diversity in the workplace and a dignity-centered client services. Building on our reforms through which 85% of SNAP food stamps applications and recertifications are submitted online without the need to, for clients to even come to an HRA office, uh, uh, HRA will continue to move forward with expanding online access to cash assistance clients subject to any necessary state approvals. Together with the NYPD Commissioner, we'll take the following actions. The NYPD and DSS will develop a protocol for determining appropriate instances in which HRA peace officers and HRA centers should seek the assistance of NYPD. The NYPD and DSS will develop a protocol to deploy an NYPD supervisor to be part of the NYPD response team for any such HRA assistance requests. And finally, the NYPD and DSS will develop a protocol for transferring control of an incident to the NYPD when the NYPD arrives at an HRA center. Now I'd like to begin my testimony today and focus on our continued commitment to immigrant uh, New Yorkers. It's important to me at a time when the policies of the Trump administration have become increasingly inhumane and punitive to unequivocally restate our commitment to ensuring all New Yorkers in need, including immigrants, have access to our agency's benefits and services. Each year, HRA addresses the needs of more than three million low-income New Yorkers including immigrants. This administration, in partnership with the City Council, has made a historic and unprecedented investment in legal services for immigrant New Yorkers to dramatically increase access to a range of legal supports through a variety of programs. At the same time, the administration and the Council have created and fosters the infrastructure to allow this, our city to respond quickly and forcefully to an immigration legal landscape that changes often and to meet emergent legal needs of immigrant families and individuals in New York City. I'm pleased to report that New York City is a national leader in providing access to justice for people in need. We work to cl in close partnership with our colleagues at Moya and with legal services providers and community-based organizations to understand the legal needs experienced by immigrant New Yorkers and to design and implement the most effective service to quickly respond to those needs. As Commissioner Mustafi said, we couldn't do this important work without the tremendously important work of our partners in the community, the legal services providers, and community-based organizations. One major component of our effort is HRA's Office of Civil Justice. The Office of Civil Justice was created in 2015, pursuant to local legislation, to oversee, manage, and monitor city-supported legal services available to low-income New Yorkers and other residents in need. The establishment of the office coincides with New York City's unprecedented investment in civil legal services programs for New Yorkers at the, the start of the de Blasio administration in 2014. This fiscal year, the administration committed $142 million towards civil justice programs at our Office of Civil Justice. The de Blasio administration's investment in civil legal services in fiscal year 2019 includes $31 million, $31 million in legal services for immigration and legal services. This represents a 13-fold increase in mayoral funding for immigration legal assistance programs since fiscal year 2013, when it was 2.1 million. With this funding, the administration supports programs that address the variety of legal needs immigrant New Yorkers uh, by providing access to high-quality legal assistance. As you've heard from Commissioner Mustafi, the Action NYC program provides free, safe, and high-quality immigration legal services to immigrant New Yorkers in need, including free comprehensive legal screenings for possible forms of relief at locations across the city, as well as Know Your Rights forums and other outreach efforts designed to widely disseminate accurate and reliable information about the immigration legal system to reduce fraud, misinformation, and confusion in the community. At HRA, the Office of Civil Legal Justice, the largest and most expansive of our immigration legal services programs is the Immigrant Opportunity Initiative, or IOI. Through this program, which was first established with the award of discretionary funding by the City Council, networks of nonprofit legal providers and community-based organizations conduct outreach in immigrant communities across the city and provide legal assistance to primarily low-income immigrant New Yorkers in matters ranging from citizenship and lawful permanent residency applications to more complex immigration matters, including asylum applications and removal defense work. 
Starting in uh, fiscal year 2017, following an RFP and a competitive bidding process for multi-year contracts, the administration increased our funding for immigration legal services through IOI. IOI was initially funded by the administration at $3.2 million annually, but in the spring of 2016, after working with the council, including the chair, and in recognition of the need for additional quality legal representation for immigrant New Yorkers facing more complicated legal cases, IOI providers received supplemental mayoral funding of $2.7 million for per, to provide representation to 1,000 complex immigration cases, including asylum applications, special immigrant juvenile status, or SIG cases, uh, and uh, UNT visa applications. Baseline mayoral funding for immigration legal services programs was dramatically increased again in fiscal year 2018 in the out years to include $16.4 million in additional baseline funding to respond to the pressing need for representation in removal proceedings, support assistance with seeking alternative forms of immigration relief for DREAMers and other immigrant New Yorkers, as well as to meet the increasing challenges posed by sh the shifting landscape for federal immigration law and policy. With this investment, the administration has been able to continue to support uh, our support for legal representation in complex cases, as well as dramatically increase the availability of free legal representation in removal proceedings. The flexibility of the IOI program has enabled the city to provide additional funding to a variety of legal services providers, including community and borough-based nonprofit legal offices and groups. These providers specialize in providing legal services to vulnerable populations, such as children and domestic violence survivors, as well as citywide legal provider organizations, allowing for a rapid increase in much needed service capacity. Particularly in light of the ever-changing federal immigration policy landscape, it is more important than ever to have a nimble structure that allows us to stand up legal services where they are most needed. The contracts with the IOI service provider consortia that HRA administers through the Off Office of Civil Justice allow for rapid deployment of funding and staff and resources to assist the immigrant community across the continuum of services, for brief legal counseling to full uh, legal representation in cases like removal and asylum matters. In total, the city's IOI program is funded at $22 million in fiscal year 2019, including $19.5 million in administration funding, as well as $2.6 million in council discretionary grants and funds over 50 different nonprofit organizations and legal providers serving immigrant communities across the city. This funding is expected to provide legal services in over 10,000 immigration matters this year, including legal representation in approximately 2,500 removal cases in defense of immigrant New Yorkers ensnared in the Trump administration's deportation machine. The administration's support for IOI includes a dedicated $4.1 million in mayoral funding this year to help address the legal needs of unaccompanied youth here in New York City facing the threat of removal, including legal help for those children separated from their parents or loved ones at the southern border by the Trump administration. This funding was finalized this fall following the rapid response to the border crisis, and it has allowed us to partner with legal services providers to further increase capacity for legal defense and deportation proceedings for over 900 separated and unaccompanied immigrant youth, to increase funding for social work and case management resources to address the acute needs of these children, and to provide resources to address legal screening and risk assessment needs of family members seeking to be sponsors of separated children in facilities in the custody of the Federal Office of Refugee Resettlement in New York City, facilitating their release from such facilities. In addition to IOI, HRA manages immigration legal services programs funded through the Federal Community Service Block Grants, totaling $2.1 million, administered in partnership with the Department of Youth and Community Development. With these CSBG funding, Legal services organizations provide a range of services such as legal assistance to help immigrant adults and youth attain citizenship and lawful immigration status, as well as services targeted to groups such as immigrant survivors of domestic violence and human trafficking, low-wage immigrant workers at risk of exploitation and violations of employment rights, and immigrant youth in foster care. In addition to the administration's commitment, I want to again acknowledge the ongoing commitment of the City Council, Speaker Corey Johnson, uh, the chair of this committee and this committee in expanding access to justice by funding legal services. HRA also oversees immigration legal services uh, funded through the council discretionary grants. This year, in addition to the council's 2.6 million allocation for providers through IOI, the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project, or NIFA, is funded by a city council discretionary grant providing legal representation for low-income detained immigrants facing removal at the Varick Street Immigration Court 
This year, NIFA is funded at 10 million and is expected to serve approximately 1,600 individuals in deportation proceedings. HRA also administers the Unaccompanied Minors Initiative and the Immigrant Children's Advocates Relief Effort, which, are, which were developed by the City Council in partnership with Robin Hood Foundation and the New York Community Trust to provide legal and social services to address the surge of immigrant children living in New York City. The program provides unaccompanied immigrant and refugee children in New York City with counsel and the opportunity to apply for uh, relief from removal and the opportunity to receive much needed social, medical, and mental health services. Many of these children are eligible for a range of statutory protections, including asylum for those fleeing past and future prosecution. Special immigrant juvenile status, SIG, for children who have been abused, neglected, and, or abandoned. You are T visas for those who have been the victims of certain crimes or human trafficking and other relief. With two million in city funding and FY19, the program is expected to serve approximately 550 immigrant youth facing removal. In all, the city's total investment in legal assistance programs for immigrants exceeds 48 million in FY19, an exponential increase from just 7 million in FY13. That's including the council and the administration's resources. Moving forward, the importance of continued citywide collaboration. As Commissioner Mustafi aptly laid out in her testimony, this city has much to be proud of regarding the accomplishments in our efforts to provide a continuum of legal services to immigrant New Yorkers, whether they need accurate and reliable legal advice on their options, help with adjusting their status, expert guidance in the naturalization process, a defender in the removal proceedings, or emergency legal assistance in immigration court. Still, there is more work to be done, and we remain committed to working closely with our partner agencies, legal services providers, and community-based organizations to build on our progress to maximize the effectiveness and efficiencies of these programs. New York City is a proud city of immigrants, and we will do everything we can to mitigate the impact of the federal government's divisive actions and rhetoric. We're committed to continue providing services that evolve with the ever-changing federal policy landscape to address the most pressing needs of immigrant New Yorkers. With the partnership of this council, our unprecedented investments to these programs continue to place New York City as the leader in ensuring that low-income New Yorkers have access to justice. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. I want to thank you both uh, for uh, being here, uh, testifying, um, describing, I think, what we can all feel proud of right now in terms of what the city has done, not just in here, uh, not just here in the city, but the impacts to other cities who are actually following our lead. I think that's an incredible testament to the work that we do and how we do that in partnership. And so I don't want to, I don't want to, um, I don't want to miss that opportunity to say thank you as a, as a real partner uh, in this. Um, I also want to say thank you for, uh, for Commissioner for restating your, your work around, uh, around Jasmine and her family and her son. Um, I think nothing can take away the impact that happened, uh, both the physical and psychological impact to her, her son, the people around her. Um, and as we all watched, that, that trauma is, is real. I think what makes it so um, important here in this discussion is we, we think about the gravity that these instances have in our country and in our borders. And when, when families are ripped, ripped away, we, we have a response, an emotional response. Um, but here you've taken action. You've taken action as a city uh, commissioner uh, and with a lot of power to make influence and impact. On, as we move towards the immigration conversation, we have that same feeling when we see families separated and our, and our role becomes more complicated. And so the focus today is to think about how we can understand that gap. What is that gap so that we can get to justice in the city way? As I believe the city is, we're almost with the courts <laughs> and the courts today just delivered a great great blow against Trump, um, but our city has a role and responsibility to respond uh, and to get it right uh, for families. And so that's our, our role today. And the two different buckets that we're gonna be asking questions around are really the mechanism, and you talked about the nimble mechanism uh, and how we support our service providers and work together, and then also the dollar gap. What is that dollar gap and what are, what are we talking about in terms of of funding need, and I think those are, those are the two different categories uh, from all the different questions that we have 
am prepared for you today. Uh, and so what I'm gonna start with is the um, part of the mechanism conversation is really thinking about how, how, how you're doing this work. And so I wanna ask uh, Commissioner Mustafi to talk a little bit about the task force uh, and whether or not the task force is involved in this question about legal services and have, have you convened the task force for this question at hand um, about, about legal services and that gap in a time of Trump? Um, so thank you for the question. Um, as it relates to, I guess, the way that other agencies have uh, interacted or been involved in conversations with, around legal services, um, we have not centralized this issue with the task force yet. Um, it's, that's something that we could, could certainly do and um, I think uh, would be an important conversation to bring. Um, we have worked closely, as you heard from um, Commissioner Banks, together in ensuring that the work that we're doing across our agencies, both in terms of understanding the landscape and the needs, um, is closely in sync. Um, we've also worked with agencies who have addressed uh, issues uh, with us, including the mayor's office to end and, and, and uh, domestic violence and gender-based violence um, uh, in looking at funding needs that they had to address the needs of the clients that they were serving, um, or rather are serving. Um, that's one area we've worked in coordination with many city agencies to be responsive to the particular shifts in immigration policies, most recently around public charge, um, and in so doing, recognizing that there is a necessity at the agency level to be able to have the right information on how they're able to direct people to those needs, and so um, kind of doing cross-agency education on how to direct how to direct uh, clients or New Yorkers that are coming interaction interactions with our agencies to immigration legal services. Um, we've additionally done that work really closely with the Department of Education. That's one of the tenants of the Action NYC program is actually bringing the legal services within the school system. So being responsive to what the needs are at the individual school level. Um, and then separately with h, &H at the hospitals. So looking directly at uh, what the needs are of the patient base that they're seeing, um, and I know the council has uh, increased funding as well to immigration legal services in h, &H. So there's a couple key uh, agencies that we've worked with to actually uh, provide the provision of legal services through the agency's work, and then more broadly across all agencies, how they can actually direct people to those services. We've done that education at both senior levels and programmatic levels, but also at training outreach teams. Got it. So what I'm, what I'm understanding is that uh, you haven't activated the, the task force for this conversation, but you're working individually with all the different agencies to get a sense of access points for legal services yeah. and developing ways to either bring that to the agency or, um, or, or that, that's it. Or training direct. their staff so that they can direct. Training staff yes. at, at city agencies. Yes. Okay, and that's that's the agency side. Tell me a little bit about your your communication with the legal service providers, um, and um, well, even before the providers, how are you getting the information about legal representation needs of immigrant New Yorkers directly? Is there a mechanism that that's allowing you to? to get that data, rather than an agency or a service provider, but directly from New Yorkers? Sure, um, so a couple of ways I would say that that comes in, um, recognizing that it's all a little bit imperfect. Um, so from a purely kind of data perspective, we look at what's publicly available data, mostly through TRAC on um, the immigration court system. Um, from a uh, sort of on the ground perspective, Moya as well as OCJ are in constant conversation with providers, understanding sort of what their needs are. They raise with us where they, when they see a sort of an increase or a spike um, in caseload. Um, we, through Action NYC, very closely monitor our hotline. Um, that's a really key indicator for us when there are increased spikes or demands in appointments, why, understanding it, making sure we're effectively triaging it. Um, and then um, I would say the, the last piece that's really important is through the Know Your Rights programming work. So last year we required, um, in partnership with the Robin Hood Foundation with that initiative, 
that at every single um, forum, we were noting how many legal uh, re referrals were needed from it. Um, so to kind of gauge what the need in the communities were where uh, folks were deeply engaged. That's part of what we'll continue to do and track this year. And as, uh, if I could just uh, add to that answer, <clears throat> I mean, as you know, I spent most of my time outside of government, uh, but I, I think one of the things that's unique about the approach is actually the collaboration between Moya and HRA. And so, so often you see, you know, agencies just replicating the same thing, but the partnership here gives the ability uh, uh, and the relationship for Moya to be um, analyzing and that sort of interaction with, with uh, community groups and, and the uh, advocacy community. And at the same time, HRA has the role of managing the legal service relationships. And so we're getting multiple sources of information and of course, the groups that we contract with are on the ground trusted organizations. And so the, the process of, that, that goes into each federal change, for example, is information coming to Moya, information coming to us from the providers, collaboration uh, where, where we're both analyzing what the change means. And there's the ability to respond in real time because there's already, we set up the relationship that's there before the crisis. And I think that is helping us through a very difficult time for New Yorkers and for our providers and, and for all of us watching what's going on and responding to it rapidly. And I think the, the, <coughs> this, the source of this question is really around understanding, understanding how, how nimble this is internally so that we can, at the city council, figure out how, how the mechanism for gathering data and it's really great to hear about the Know Your Rights piece, how we can actually see that ourselves as well. So how are you tracking that so that we can get a report about, about this in real time as well? I think it benefits us uh, when we think about budget priorities, and we're gonna soon be in the middle of the budget throws. Um, and I wanna welcome our finance chair, immigration uh, committee member, past immigration chair, uh, council member Danny Drum to this conversation. And, and, uh, and really kind of think about this together. And, and so it's helpful for us to get that information as well. So I, I don't know how you can prepare that and, and share that with us. Uh, we'll probably put that in a letter requesting some of that and, and how, what data you're getting so you can, we, can, we can learn together about that. Uh, we have our own ways of doing that through our district offices, of course, but, but more data gives you a better picture and sharing that would be, would be good. Specifically, wondering if you have track changes in case outcomes or the length of case over time using the EOIR data. Is that something that you've used before and have been able to analyze? You mean the track data? The track data. She's shaking her head. So. Well, the, the, <laughs> there's data that we, the EOIR data using, so we're trying to figure out if, if, if you've seen a, a change in case length of time Mm -hmm. using the EOIR data? I think that's the question. Yeah, so I think it is the track data that you're referring to, um, which is EOIR data, but I, but. Is it just like, we're, we're just don't, we're not saying the same. Or is there a data? <laughs> I just wanna make sure we're speaking my lang the same language. Yeah, me too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so it might be the same data. Okay. How about you give us the data and sure. then we'll, we'll confirm. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so uh, I think as, as you're aware, um, EOIR is not super, super forthcoming with all of their data. So what ends up happening is TRAC, which is I believe based in Syracuse, requests all of this data and then they publish it. Um, so um, back to your question in terms of what we're seeing in terms of uh, kind of backlogs, is that what you indicated? Just, and backlog and also just the, the case, the length of time for case, per, per case. in real time as we've moved from Obama into uh, yeah. Trump? Yeah. Um, so I think it's hard for us to speak to that um, quite yet. I think largely our understanding of what that looks like is based on the increase in cases that are backlogged um, and what we're hearing from providers in terms of cases being scheduled out um, two years plus um, for their merits hearings and, so, and even a, a delay or continuation. We've separately um, engaged in a uh, conversation with the new acting chief judge of the immigration court on this question 
um, to understand what they're seeing and to see what their plans are to address this issue. Um, they have plans, as they've stated to us, to expand the number of judges um, in both the non-detained and the detained courts. Um, and we have asked to remain in continued conversation to understand what those changes will look like and obviously to work and share that with providers uh, so that there can be uh, better coordination and preparation for, for those changes. Got it. Um, so I'm just gonna read what my counsel is telling me here, that the track uses EO, EOIR data to do the analysis, yep. so. Okay. So I think we're, we're, we're good. good on that. Great. <laughs> um, but I guess what I want to, uh, actually what I want to do now is, is hand it over to Councilmember Drum. He has a specific question, and then I'm going I'm to continue with, with mine. Councilmember Drum. Thank you very much. My question really is around language uh, accessibility. Uh, I think I've asked this, I've asked this before, but uh, excuse me, I have a bit of a cold, and I had a vote before this, which is why I'm late <clears throat> getting here. But my understanding is that the largest number of deportation cases are among Asian Americans and particularly Chinese speakers. <coughs> and um, I'm wondering if there's any demographic or statistics on what types of services are being provided to those communities in particular, um, because that's really important in terms of preventing those deportations. Yeah, thank you so much for um, that question. I want to see if we have some um, breakdowns. I think we do that we can share with you. Um, and I'll start while um, searching for that by quickly stating that um, we recognize through um, our first uh, sort of run at, run at things with Action NYC that even though that was an area where we were seeking to increase um, services in underserved communities, um, our fir the first grantees, um, there were still gaps, right? We were seeing real strong gaps in underserved communities, inclu including the Asian community, both Chinese, uh, Korean services, South Asian services. So we issued an, a new RF, uh, RFP process to directly get at some of those concerns. I'm happy to say that through, thank you, through that, um, through that we were able to uh, do grants to community-based organizations that are particularly focused on serving some of the populations that you describe. So that includes um, Chaya CDC, COPO, the Chinese Planning Council, um, and Korean uh, Services Center. So um, that is new for this fiscal year, and I think I think directly goes to what we also had seen and observed in, in your question. I think in terms of um, breakdowns um, about the top five languages um, spoken uh, as kind of a control in, in speaking to this question in our fiscal 17 IOI and CSBG cases, um, about 4% were of Chinese dialect, so Cantonese, Mandarin, um, Fuzhou, and, and others. So we agree underserved, which is part of why we did that grant funding. Excuse me. So, with the with the grant and the RFP that went out, that's currently in the works now. Yes. Yeah, so, and we don't have numbers on how successful that's been yet. Not yet. This is. When the will first that year. come back? Um, so, this is the first year uh, for that programming. Um, we we definitely um, modeled it, recognizing that the need was in smaller organizations. So, the model is for slightly lower. Uh, cases, case loads, but targeted for those populations. So we'll have something um, soon to speak from on, on what we project will be the cases for those, for those uh, grants. And Commissioner, how are we making um, folks in the Asian communities in particular aware of the services and the programs that are available? Um, a couple of different ways. So that, uh, that grant funding and the program as a whole also included money for outreach and Know Your Rights forums. So those service providers are able to use a community-based navigator to boot, both do intake but also outreach and engagement, and they do use that. They go to the ESL classes that the providers uh, might be doing. They do off-site events and, and so on and so forth to engage uh, their population. Additionally, one of the things that we've uh, aimed to do as Moya is increase access to information through community and ethnic media. Um, 
we, we did so in response to the robocalls that we heard were going out, uh, meeting directly with different community media outlets, actually producing a, a one-pager about what was happening and how they could access free and confidential legal services that was published in, in uh, papers directly, Chinese paper outlets. Um, and we do also through the Know Your Rights programming. So in this uh, recent initiative for the next several months, um, one of the providers is AMPS, um, who will focus primarily on the Asian community. Okay, so um, by the, when did you say it was going to be done, finished? You'll have an update on it? We can get you an update on where uh, we are, but this is the first full fiscal year. Okay, because when we go into the budget season, I would really like to know what those numbers are. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks. Agreed, and, and we'll work together on that. Uh, uh, Councilmember Drum. And so I, I want to start kind of big and ask both of you as commissioners and in, in, in the team effort that you're putting into this larger question about legal representation and, and if you've identified any specific gaps in city funded services related to ensuring legal serv services, legal representation in immigration court. Have you identified that gap? I'd like to kind of hear both of your perspectives on that. Sure, so I can start, um, and largely I think as you heard through our testimony, a lot of what we've done in the last two years is set, the, set this sort of larger landscape or spectrum of how people can kind of start and enter into getting immigration legal services in the city and how these different programs are speaking to one another through the work that we do. Um, I think um, we've heard from providers um, as we've started to make decisions around inc the increased funding mm -hmm. on what the needs are. We had really hoped and targeted a lot of that um, funding resource to be around uh, removal defense and deportation defense. Um, we That is the reality, um, but we also heard from providers that given the moment in time we're in with the sort of complexity of the federal immigration legal landscape, with the end of TPS, with the end of um, DACA, thankfully not um, on both fronts exactly yet, um, uh, the Muslim ban and so forth, that there was a need to, to maintain more flexibility in other kinds of cases at this time um, and not to, to solely focus on deportation defense. So we were responsive to that and it makes perfect sense um, in, in the way that we structured um, the funding stream, which, which Commissioner Banks can speak to. Um, we also know that this is a lot of new resources infused in the community and a lot of organizations are hiring. Um, so I think it will, time, a little bit of time will tell in terms of kind of where the remain big gaps and what that looks like. And Commissioner, before you go, um, Commissioner Banks, before you go, Commissioner Mustafi, I just want to get a sense from, from you, because um, you're right, the, the, the testimony really kind of gave the work that's done up until this point. And it, it sounds like what you're saying is that the gap here really is is one allowing for the, the services to kind of mature in some ways, both through hiring, there's a lot of infusion of money into the services world, the legal services world, and we're, you're still kind of waiting to kind of see how, how it's going. But I didn't hear necessarily that there was a there was a real gap um, of of need. Is that I just want to? Is there? Do we have a gap in need from your perspective? And I guess that's the question: Is there a gap in need? I mean, if, if the question is, are there people who don't have representation who are immigrants in the city? I think the answer is yes, right? Okay. Going through deportation so, and then, so how are you defining that? <laughs> yes. How are you defining that need? Sure. For so, those those immigrant immigrant community members who aren't getting legal services yeah, today. So in terms of um, in terms of the removal defense context, um, you know, I think, as I said, some of that is is fluctuating and hard to know because of the backlog and other things, but estimates um, could be anywhere close to 10,000 New York City residents um, who are in removal proceedings who might be unrepresented at this time. Um, I think that the um, broader question that you're asking and representation generally, I think 
that's something that through the work that we're doing, particularly uh, in the outreach um, space and in the work that we're doing with agencies just to be um, in locations, um, we are, uh, you know, being responsive where we see that there's a need, we're trying to triage and be smart about that. Um, I think it's hard to pinpoint like a particular area at this time. We felt good in the last several months at the capacity to make appointments uh, for people who are calling through Action NYC. That's something we're closely monitoring to see what the needs are there. Thank you. So I, I think there's a, a couple of, uh, I think piece of information that I want to provide you with in answer to your question, but I also want to emphasize something that you said and Commissioner Mustafa said and I said too. We're in an ever-changing environment and there are things the legal services providers are responding to today that none of us could have imagined two years ago. So to me, that's why the work that, frankly, we did together, uh, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner myself, Moya, and, and uh, HRA, Jordan Dressler, the Civil Justice Coordinator, and U.S. Chair, that we did several years ago to actually create a way to respond. It, you know, it seemed very bureaucratic at the time to talk about building a, an infrastructure, but I do, and I, I think it mer merits putting on the record because we worked together on that uh, with the council. I, I do remember. You know, when I ran legal aid, every time there'd be a new problem, it'd have to be a new RFP and a, and, and a new procurement process, and that meant delay and delay and delay responding to need. So when you use the word gap, I keep thinking to myself, are we able to respond to emerging need quickly? That's an important indicia of, of responsiveness of the infrastructure that we'll put together. <clears throat> so creating those IOI contracts uh, two years ago or so, uh, that were consortia-based, both large organizations and community-based organizations, uh, that part of the approach there was to say, let's create an ability to respond without having to issue a new RFP every time something new happened. The number of new things that have happened since January two, 2017 were certainly not anticipated in 2016 when we began this route down this path with you, but I think we're all in good stead in terms of addressing gap that way, the ability to respond quickly. I think a second and, and issue with respect to, to any question about uh, a gap between need and, and, uh, and availability of service is capacity. And you know, as you, as you know, and, and you were, were very supportive of this and helpful, actually uh, all, all members of, of the council were, the issue about implementing uh, greater access in housing court cases, we found, we had pilot, pi we put pilots in place, we found what the issues were, but it wasn't just a question of money, it's a question of building capacity. We have terrific legal services providers on the ground and so I don't mean building their capacity to serve, but building the capacity to absorb and expand and have, and have the same trusted quality assurance that the legal services community has had historically, supervision, training, oversight. Uh, that's how uh, clients can be assured when they come to a legal services provider, they get something that meets their needs, to go back to that word, than if they go to somebody who's going to file some application and charge them money for something that they weren't even eligible for. So, Another important piece of analyzing uh, need versus available services is the, that capacity building function. And I think what we've seen as we expanded uh, the funding in this dramatic expansion over the last several years is the need to make sure we're respectful and working collaboratively with legal services providers so that the capacity can expand. Lastly, I just want to highlight the council had the foresight to require us to have an annual uh, report um, it's due in March, and we will certainly be considering, uh, based upon available information, what we're seeing on the ground. But I want to caution us all that part of how we think about planning and, and Moya and, and HRA is space within the capacity to respond to new things that we haven't even projected might occur. And that's a really important in, a part of capacity, not just saying, well, how many people are seeking your services today and how many can you serve? We think it's important to continue to build in that responsiveness, which has really characterized these last two years uh, or so in the community, uh, being very responsive to things that the council and we have identified as the most emergent issue of the day. And so it's, there are multiple levels in, in looking at this uh, need question, I think. 
And I guess my, my, my immediate question is uh, trying to anticipate that nature of need that might not be present today, but will be, all we have to do is look at the last two years, how much of that um, unknown will prevent us from moving forward and will it even have an impact in allowing us to move forward? Yeah, th there again, I think you really have to look at that second part of defining a, a gap or a need is building capacity uh, to absorb uh, increased funding and to expand services. And I think one of the things that we're very much engaged in with the providers now is, believe it or not, the three years of the contracting process have, have gone past us and now we're in a renewal. Um, all those baseline contracts are registered and so it's a question of working with already existing registered contracts because of the things that you and we did together a couple of years ago to build this delivery system. And we're very much engaged in those conversations with providers now in terms of what they're seeing on the ground and, and, and what the capacity is to respond. And we're going to hear from some of the service sure. providers, too, later, um, which, is, which is good. And I guess maybe it's an opportunity to go into the IOI questions that, that, that we have. Uh, really with, in, in some ways, you're kind of giving us that update that, that you're kind of moving through it. You're working with the legal service providers to understand capacity. Um, is, is there... It, is there a way that you can give us a breakdown of the 19.6 million and categorically kind of give us a sense about how the IOI is being spent so let me, uh, through, through IOI? So if I could, let me maybe try to give you a, a top line of it and then we can proceed from okay. there. So in, in looking at um, the, I, I guess I'm going to define it as the HRA administered program, so IOI, uh, CSBG, not Action NYC, uh, we saw in uh, 17 that approximately 6,250 cases were handled. We saw in 18, 8,000 cases were handled. And we're projecting in uh, 19, again, looking at IOI and CS, uh, CSBG only, we're projecting approximately 11,000 cases being handled. So you can see in the same way we saw in the housing area, mm -hmm. our investments and, and working together with the providers, there's, there is a significant uh, increase uh, in the capacity of the providers and then ultimately the actual services that New Yorkers are getting. Um, I also want to lay out a little bit, again, sort of more of a, a, a top line level about um, sort of the, the breakdown, if you will, uh, of the services. Um, about 10% of the $16 million number, you know, that was really the increase. About 10% of that is specifically budgeted for case management, social work, outreach, and administrative costs. And I know this was something in our prior, I thought, very productive conversations you had uh, wanted us to um, focus on. I also want to, you know, sometimes... I used to feel this way when I ran a legal service program, but sometimes there's a lot of focus on cases instead of caseload. And I think what we're trying to contract for is a caseload as opposed to a certain, you know, mechanistic view of, of cases. Why do we say that? Because these are terrific providers. And, for example, you might invest in removal defense, but they're also going to need to do an asylum case because the defense of the, of the removal is only part of what needs to happen. So we're looking at it as a holistic caseload of what needs to get done to deliver the services. And so I think we're projecting uh, in FY19 uh, about 32% uh, of the caseload. I want to be careful with that term. 32% of the caseload is going to be removal defense. And the other 68% are going to be both straightforward and complex applications to obtain status, to obtain an, or maintain status. So like asylum, uh, SIDGE cases, DACA. Uh, but again, th this is operating very much the way when we first had some of those conversations about the interplay between complex cases and other cases. And I think you can see a lot of what you uh, were, were asking us to do reflected in, in the way we're trying to approach this. You know, having said that, again, in FY, for FY20, we're very much engaged in conversation with providers about the next iteration of this uh, going forward. When, when is the next contract renewal, renewal for it, IOI? It is for uh, effective July 1, uh, 
uh, 19, so FY20, beginning of FY20. July 1, July, so that. Ju July 1 of, uh, of calendar year 2019, but it's an FY20 budget. FY20. Year. Got it. So the, the, the renewal will happen in July. Yeah, the, but the the negotiations are happening to, now. Are happening now. Got it. And so again, when, when does that end? When when are the negotiations end for that? So here's here's the the sort of complexity of negotiations. Mm -hmm. At some point, if you say, "Well, this is it, take it or leave it," you don't get as good a result if you keep having the iteration back and forth and back and forth. If you keep having the back and forth, then you have why did it take you so long? But I actually think the back and forth is a valuable exercise in and of itself. <laughs> Got it. I think I get it. Um, on the on the point that you made about the, the flexibility, mm -hmm. is the administration considering changing the policy of the contracting with the groups? Um, you talked about caseload. So is this one of those conversations about the back and forth? Uh, and you you describe the issue here with caseload versus the, the kind of case specific specific. Specific specificity, but are you thinking about uh, re reconfiguring that uh, for the next contract for IOI? Um, and I, th I, think, I think you kind of said it, but I just want to kind of hear some clarity around, around how, how we build uh, in the name of flexibility and ability for, for one case to bring five others and be able to kind of move forward. I I think that's part of the, the very good conversation that's going on. Look, okay. in the immigration area. So you're open, that's, that's something that people are, in your administration are open to discussing. I think we still have a, a productive engagement, I guess I would put it that way. But I, I, I think for context, you know, when we do a housing, um, a legal services contract, tenant representation, the trajectory of the case, there are, you know, nothing, no two cases are necessarily gonna go the same route when you, when you look at them to begin with, but there's some parameters for how they're gonna proceed. In this area, with these changes, with the, with the emergent issues that are rising, a case could be very active this year and in a dormant state next year and then active three years from now. This is what the challenge is, is, is for the providers and for us to come up with a framework to deal with this, with this complexity. Because it's not only the complexity of what the Trump administration is trying to do to our clients, it's the complexity of the ability of the providers to manage through it with all of these different factors going on. And again, I, we, we need to understand it on our side as well. Mm -hmm. uh, one, just for the budget piece and really pushing for budget, but also joining you in thought around how we construct these these contracts um, as we think about our our constituents and the legal service providers as well. So um, thank you for sharing that. I think one of the other things that comes up a lot in discussions with legal service providers are uh, supervising attorneys and whether or not how how do that how do they become part of the discussion, not just in the negotiations but the system itself, the nimbleness of the system, the responsiveness of the system. I mean, look, I think. I was a supervisor in legal services. I think a, a line supervisor at one point. I think that supervisors are an important part of the service delivery. Uh, I know that uh, you know our our, criminal, our uh, civil justice coordinator Jordan Dressler is carrying on those negotiations. I think he knows how I feel, which is important to have supervisors be an active part of the delivery system. Uh, I think you know from our prior conversations, I always had some cases that I handled, the caseload. So I think all this is part of a conversation about the best way to, to take the resources we've got, the needs of the providers, and the needs of the clients, and come out with an appropriate um, uh, 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 you know, way of proceeding forward for the next year. I'll, I'll just add to that by saying a couple of things. So I think Steve um, you know, aptly noted that part of it is um, you know, you're, you as a provider are thinking about what it takes for your operation to, to deliver on this deliverable. And we hope that that takes into consideration the importance of supervision and all of those things. Um, I think separately, and this builds on the capacity question too, one of the reasons that we structured Action NYC the way that we did um, is because of this, uh, this need to support uh, 
newer providers, smaller, smaller community-based providers, and being able to build their capacity to do this work. Um, and you can't do that without supervision. So the, the whole program is structured so that there's a partnership between the community-based providers and a legal services organization that brings in the supervision. Um, and so that is specifically delineated in that way for that program because it seeks to address, I think, the question that you're asking, which is how are you ensuring that uh, you have kind of different kinds of providers able to do this work and that supervision is at the heart of their ability to do it. Right, and I think it's important for everyone to know uh, who is trying to follow this really technical conversation, Action NYC is not part of IOI. Right. And so you've been able to kind of maneuver through a, a different program, smaller program, yep. through supervising attorneys that have shown some good responses. And the, the, now the question is, how do you put it into this larger contract, negotiate with a lot more and different providers, mostly, I think, um, some, some overlap. But, but how, and, how, and how do we keep moving that forward for a better, a better program? And you're saying Action NYC has actually shown and proven um, the value of additional supervising attorneys. Is, as that, is that what to, I heard? As a way to build capacity in smaller organizations. And I think that is a question that's probably different depending on the organization that you're talking to. You know, if you're talking about some of the larger um, providers who have, do this work kind of day in, day out, and it's their bread and butter and are doing the complex and removal defense work that that uh, fall within the IOI contracting, there might be a different calculus on how and what matters in the way that you're structuring your contract. And I think that's part of our ongoing conversation. But and just again for context, take for example, you know, the IOI, the IOI program is a series of, uh, you know, the several consortia uh, in addition to some citywide providers. So take the urban justice uh, center consortia, for example, like within, under the urban justice umbrella, you've got African Community Together, Catholic Charities, Community Services, Catholic Migration Services, Chinese Staff and Workers Association, Damayan, DASIS Rising Up and Moving, Make the Road, Min Kwan Center, uh, National Mobilization Against Sweatshops, New Immigrant Community Empowerment, Workers Justice Project. So you've got a, you've got on both sort of our strands of work here that are connected, We've got Action NYC with very much on the ground uh, organizations plus the legal overlay, and then within IOI you have a similar approach. So we're, we're trying to get at trusted, respected, expert legal providers in, in, um, uh, in collaboration with on the ground, respected, community-based organizations. And final question on this, uh, but I think it's important. The, com the whole conversation about uh, supervising attorneys, do the contracts today prohibit organizations from hiring additional uh, supervisory attorneys? No, I think that's part of the budget negotiations. We're looking for- That's for the next contract, but I guess I'm talking uh, about these current- no, no, but I think it's fair to say, I, I wanna uh, be fair for answering the question to make sure that uh, I'm being fair to both what we're trying to accomplish and what the providers are interested in accomplishing. It's part of a budget negotiation, whether it's our current budget for any particular provider's contract or next year, looking at what we're, tr what we're trying to procure as the caseload from a particular provider, uh, which ultimately is individual uh, New Yorkers getting help. Uh, that's what the, I referred to before as we think it's important to keep going back and forth rather than saying here's what it is. Eventually you do get to, hey, we're at the end, but I think it's an important iterative process. Okay, well I think, I think you know what, what um, I'm pushing anyway, is, is a real look at, at an ecosystem that is healthy and I'm hearing additional, as per Action NYC, kind of showing us the model, uh, the ability and the flexibility for that. Uh, you mentioned the four, both of you mentioned the $4.1 million allocated for legal assistance uh, for migrant children back in September. I, uh, I just need to ret reply to a text message. Okay.
I can start. Yeah. Well, Commissioner Mustafi, if you can start. Sure. Uh, the breakdown that we understand is that three to, there's 3.2 million for legal services and then the 907.5 for case management services. Uh, is this allocation only for FY19? Uh, is this like a one-time shot for, for this community, uh, specifically the migrant children community? And, and then I guess the, 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 the kind of other question is, what was this money doing back in FY18? And did that change? Sure. So um, this money was part of the the um, expansion of um, money, the 16 or so million that we were speaking with providers about, um, and and having the back and forth about what capacity there was to take how many cases. Um, uh, as we had sort of ended that um, back and for initial back and forth and allocated the funding that the providers had indicated they would be able to take. Um, there remained some additional funding um, for this fiscal year, and in the aftermath of the family separation crises, um, based on the structure created by the council for the eye care program and providers really coming together and assessing what the increased need uh, for unaccompanied children were and separated families in the city, um, they came to us uh, and indicated that in order for them to uh, meet the need, they could increase their capacity and indicated to us um, what that would entail. So we were able to allocate the remainder of those funds so they're part of the IOI administration. So similar to the, the newer uh, conversations about those contracts, uh, we'll engage this, but it's baselined funding. Baseline funding re recommitted in a purpose with a specific focus, yep. and and it it was because you had extra funding coming into the new year. Money that was we had unallocated funding from the conversations we'd been having around capacity from the providers. Got it. This is a really important piece. Yep. So we're, we're we're saying what you're saying is the but the budget is X. And the need that was presented was why, and there was a there was a a, a, a kind of unallocated need that the providers, uh, after talking to, to providers, left you a gap of extra money, and this extra money, uh, in 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 coordination with what we were seeing at the separate at the border, uh, allowed you to reprogram that money because there was a gap. Or there was a not a gap, a unallocated sum. Yeah, that's right. So that's that's really interesting in this conversation about need because how how does that happen, um, and and we're going to get to a point where we're going to define soon what the gap is because I'm assuming I think we're assuming I asked you earlier we're all assuming that that there are 10,000 New Yorkers who do not have that are that go unrepresented in the city. So how how does how does that happen? Again, I'm sorry that I had to turn away to do something uh, that was urgent. It, it really is a, that question of capacity that I talked about before, which is the mere fact of making the dollars available doesn't mean that the capacity to provide the services are available. Um, we're, the capacity is there now to make use of all the dollars, but the, that period of time where there was a lag between capacity to deliver the services uh, and now gave us the benefit of having these, extra, the, these additional dollars to respond to yet another emergent problem. And I think, you know, credit goes to <coughs> providers for sort of coming together to figure out how they could take an increased caseload in an urgent time for unaccompanied children. Um, and, you know, coming to us with ideas and proposals and how they would do that. So I think they were also responding to the moment and sort of figuring out how to expand their ability to do that work in a sensitive crisis. And and I think we're we're all thankful that we had that ability to do it. Yeah. I think our our question is really trying to understand how how real the situation is on capacity. So I think what Commissioner Banks is saying is we, um, which begs a question about the 16. Point, what is it four million for IOI? The, that number became a number because of a reason, and that, that was a reason that I think we have to go back a few years, how we came up with that need, IOI. And then now we're at a point where essentially we can't spend the money fast enough because it's difficult in our legal service provider world. 
and the ecosystem that's still trying to take this money, leaving us with excess for a yes. crisis moment. And so I guess I'm trying to figure out how, how, we, how we get better at allocating funding. Um, or maybe this is a strategy, right? <laughs> you just kind of like over, over uh, budget and have flexibility but that's not the policy that we all agreed on. And there was a 16.4 million that said, this is the need, here's, here's the spend down, and, and yet here we are. Right, I think the challenge for both you and us is that we make decisions about how much money to allocate, but at the end of the day, the providers still have to be the ones implementing it. And that's why I think this process of iteration and working through together is so important here that you're right, neither you nor we or the providers would have wanted not to be able to provide services on day one, but there, there is a reality of hiring and training and having people on board and able to provide these services rather, and making sure that the quality is the quality that the organizations have, have traditionally provided. And if that is the goal, then I think we can align on that goal and then make some decisions in this next budget. Uh, those that are d directly connected to the contracting component, but also just the larger understanding of need um, as we get towards some, and I have some other questions about, about that, but. J j just to maybe close that off though, but I, I can assure you in 19 and, and moving forward into 20, all, everything's aligned between dollars and, and capacity for the ability to not have that, although uh, not have the issue that arose with uh, with 18. So it was a special moment. It was a yes. it was a uh, a fluke of the system, and now you're you're ramping up, and you can kind of get more dollars out. You, 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 I mean, you, you gave us a six thousand dollar six thousand case, eight thousand, eleven thousand case. So the cases are going up, which means that more dollars are getting out into the community. Yep. And and I still I just still I guess I can't. I'm not the legal service provider, but I'm trying to understand it as the chair of this committee. How, how you can respond to a crisis with $4.1 million um, when you can't spend it already, but you're going back to the same service providers to address a very specific issue. How, so help me unpack that. Yeah, this is honestly so, this is something that providers have done since they've been providers, manage uh, the complexity of the funding process and the ability to get, get staff on board and provide services to clients. So I think it's part this of is, the, this is how how it works. It's part of the benefit of actually having these contracts in place with, you know, expert, well-regarded providers that they're able to manage many of these challenges. Doesn't mean it's easy for them. Doesn't mean it's easy for, for for responding at all. But it it means that it, the, having enough time to train, hire, train, and uh, make sure people are ready to do cases is part of uh, what they do best. Right. So uh, my, my last questions are about Action NYC, but I have a, I have a more broad question for both of you. Um, what is the administration's position on due process and the right to counsel for immigrants without the means to afford representation? Um, we'll start there. Sure. Um, so I think as, as you all know, and I noted in my testimony, there is no right to counsel at the federal level for immigration. <laughs> Uh, immigrants who are in removal proceedings or period. Um, our position broadly is that we would believe that all individuals should uh, be able to access a right to counsel and would advocate at the federal level that that be something that becomes a requirement vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the federal administration's deportation policies. Um, I think uh, you, you are well aware, um, as, as well as others in the room, that the city and the council uh, have made a decision as to individuals who are public safety risks in the city, who've been convicted of one of a, a series of violent or uh, serious felonies um, for which the city would cooperate with immigration enforcement. And in so doing, um, the mayor announced that the use of city uh, funding immigration legal services, funding specifically um, would not go to the, those particular individuals for legal services. We believe very strongly that there should be an ability for everybody to get 
a universal screening um, and so have created such programs where individuals can get universal screenings like Action NYC, like NIFA, that have no income barriers to them. Um, and so everybody can get those screenings and at a very minimum know what uh, what they might have the right to or how they might be able to proceed in getting access to counsel uh, if we're unable to do so. So I think that's the question you're asking, so hopefully I've responded it. Commissioner Banks? I, I don't have anything to add to uh, Commissioner Mustafi's uh, very comprehensive answer. Uh, I, I do, I wanna make sure that we, we kind of clarify the, the policy that you spoke to um, or I'll, I'll step back and say the, the, the goal here is similar, I think, universal representation for all immigrants so that anyone who needs a lawyer can get one in the city of New York. And we do not have that at the federal policy. And I, and I, and I agree with you, that is far, far away in, in possibility. But where that begins is here in the city and, and so we, do, we have been fighting on this for a while now um, because it is not the policy of the city council that this carve out exists. It's not, it's not what we want. Um, it is what the mayor wants and so that's why it exists. Uh, and so, so that's, that's where we're at a crux there. But we're at, we're at a bigger question here. What, what are we doing as a city? Where, what's our role as a city? What can we do as a city? This is something that we can do. We don't need the federal government to tell us it's okay to fund these cases and all cases. Um, and that's the power of your response to Jasmine. That's our power when, when we respond to the separation of families. Uh, and that's our duty. That's what we can do. Uh, and I think that's what we're gonna be focused on understanding what that gap is and getting there uh, with every ounce of power from our community neighborhoods. Uh, so I know we are in disagreement there, but uh, and I guess, I guess the next question would have been understanding exceptions. Other than the carve out, the criminal carve out, as we understand it, uh, what other exceptions are you thinking of uh, in terms of, of uh, almost getting to universal representation? Are there any other things that we should be aware of as we move into budget negotiations that we should all know with service providers in the room who are also gonna be part of this ecosystem that we're trying to provide? <laughs> oh, there's a I apologize, I didn't realize there was a question posed. Okay, well. I, I, I think that there's do, nothing. Did you get the question? I think I know. Okay. I, 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 I think it's important. No, I do too. I just wasn't, um, wasn't quite tracking to your, to your question. I don't think there's anything new. I think that always in legal services delivery, you think about income, for example. Uh, that's certainly been how we've looked at legal services delivery in the housing area. Uh, in terms of income eligibility, and the legal services providers themselves all have income uh, eligibility of different sorts, so that's certainly a, a has been an issue, um, and I think it will continue to be an issue. Okay, well, again, we're gonna continue this debate. I think it's an important debate. I think we're aligned on so many other um, policy uh, goals here. Uh, and I think, I think what's important here is that our times are, are filled with crisis and our city has our moral obligation to respond to our community, the backbone of our, of our, of our neighborhoods and our city. Um, and so when we think about giving immigrants just the screening and the understanding of their immigration need and not be able to provide them a lawyer because they might be part of a carve out of some sort, uh, one carve out creates opportunities for other carve outs since it's a slippery slope and I, I want to just make that very very clear that universal representation is powerful because it's exactly what it is it's everyone getting a lawyer if they cannot afford it uh, and and this is going to get even more and more intense as we get through the next two years and potentially the next six years uh, and so how and we got to prepare for that and I think that the the um, 
the, the dismantling of our, of our system and the new land of immigration is different today and it's gonna have long lasting impacts. It's gonna take a while to reverse. And so we're, we're not looking just for screening, we're looking for full representation. We're not looking just for spending down X amount of dollars. We're saying we're gonna commit all the dollars necessary and the mechanism that is nimble and proactive, not just reactive, uh, with our legal service providers and help them be healthy. And that's everything that we've been doing already. Uh, but if there are very specific things that we're hearing from our, our service providers and our members, uh, city council members that are doing the work on the ground in their districts, we're gonna present that and we're gonna, we're gonna confront that. Uh, and we're gonna do that here because we have the power to get to universal representation. We have that power, we have that moral responsibility. The question is how we do that. Um, and it's gonna be through the will of the people. And that's how we're gonna do that. And let's do that together. I would just add to that, we've had a lot of productive discussions with you and with the council as a whole that have gotten us to the place we're at. And I'm sure we'll continue to have productive discussions. Good, and there are two very specific questions that are gonna be important for us. Uh, have you done any assessment of the need for immigration legal services at other h, &H sites, specifically h, &H sites? Um, I would say we are in conversations with h, &H about this um, in, in looking at sort of what the needs are and how we're meeting those needs with what are existing uh, locations and, and existing services. Um, certainly, uh, th I think it's through this fiscal year, there's increased funding through the council, so that creates a, a whole lot of taking that need where it exists. We also had funded a discrete long-term care um, legal services funding in h, h so we're looking at what that continued need looks like as they've really done a tremendous job of exhausting folks who are in long-term care, so definitely something that we're looking at and evaluating with h, &H. And then moving over to schools, uh, the actual NYC held clinics in I think over 33 DOE schools. Yeah. Uh, what do these clinics clinics consist of? Uh, is there a legal component to the clinic? If so, which group provides the legal services at the clinics held at schools right now? Sure, so we slightly restructured um, the schools programming this year um, and I can report that so far it seems to be going even better, which is great, um, in that we've focused um, outreach to be really uh, narrow on building out the school's clinics. Um, and so we're seeing an increase in participants in the schools. Um, the outreach- Participants? Are, uh, like just people coming to the schools yeah, for legal par parents? parents okay. and students. Okay. Um, the, uh, providers who do the outreach engagement include Make the Road New York, um, Little Sisters of the Assumption, Atlas DIY, um, and the providers who provide the legal services are Catholic Charities. They um, they take um, every almost every single case that comes from uh, those clinics, and if they're unable to, are able to refer it to one of our other providers. And does, how does Moya identify the, the, the school? So part of the, that uh, is a coordination between Moya and the outreach providers. So we work really closely with DOE. We look at schools where there are um, large foreign-born populations um, and work directly with the principals and administrative staff at the schools to assess and try to understand what the needs would be to provide the clinics. Um, and also the outreach or community organizers, many of whom have their own independent relationships with schools, will, will make recommendations. So um, it's kind of a shared coordination process between Moya and the providers in deciding where we should be and working with DOE to make sure we have a, a larger kind of understanding of what the need throughout the city is. Uh, thank you for that. I think it's, it's really important to understand how the, the ten tentacles of access points yeah. are decided and, and, and I think that those offer new touch points for need and understanding need and how that need changes and, and really if, if we're going to get to universal representation, these are, these are critical access points. Uh, we know that our immigrant families have trusted partners and that changes family to family. Uh, and so this is this is really critical. Hospitals, schools, organizations, their adult literacy class, whatever that is, they should be able to connect. And what I will say, um, I think that's it for questions. Unless you have a question, no. Um, 
I'll say that the responsibility isn't just on the city. This responsibility is also on the state. Uh, and we have leadership that's coming into the state. And I hope that this becomes an agenda item for all of you, uh, for you and de definitely for us, as we advocate for not just funding, but structurally changing the laws to ask for um, uh, uh, new initiatives that can allow for the empowerment of our immigrant brothers and sisters, our families in our, in our communities. Uh, and that's gonna require real leadership and connection and conversation and coalition building. Uh, and I think, I think we have more, um, more than any other city probably in the state, a model that we can take to the state as well to, to support us. Uh, because I think we do more than the state does, uh, period. And, and so there's, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of pride there. But we need to do more. I'll just add one thing on that note in particular, is mm -hmm. we're often outreached to from other cities and localities and counties throughout the state to provide technical mm -hmm. assistance and best practice, which is something we readily provide and something we're con we will continue to do um, as is helpful. Great, and it'd be great to report back to us to kind of see what, what's, what's happening there sure. as a partner, yep. uh, who you're talking to, how, how mm -hmm. things are being implemented in other cities. Yeah. Thank you both. Thank you. Happy Thank holidays. You, you too. Thank you. Uh, happy New hope Year. Get a break. If I can say that, yes. Uh, and I hope are you leaving staff as well from HRA and yes. Okay, great. So I'll, I'll I'll ask you to identify yourselves a little bit later. Thank you. Thank you both. And thank you for all of you who are staying uh, to testify. Thank you so much. And I hope this was as productive for you as it was for us. Uh, we're moving to our next panel. Uh, Amy Taylor, make the road. Come on up, please. Uh, uh, Rich uh, Limesider from the Safe Passage Project. Andrea Sayans from the Brooklyn Defender Services. Sarah Derry Oshiro, the Bronx Defenders. And then Terry Lawson from the, Brook the Bronx Legal Services and Legal Services of New York City. Thank you. Amy, you want to start? Make sure that the, the, the light is red. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Taylor. I am co-legal director of Make the Road New York. Thank you to committee chair Manchaka and to the Committee on Immigration for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of Make the Road New York and our 24,000 members. First off, we thank the city council for supporting increased funding for immigrant legal services, which has begun to address the vast unmet need for immigrant legal representation in New York City. City funding has greatly increased the capacity of organizations like ours to represent immigrant clients, and the city's commitment has sent a powerful signal of standing by the immigrant community in funding access to council. However, despite the increase in funding for these services over the past few years, we still turn away individuals seeking legal services every day. Make the Road is here today to support a bold recommendation to create a program in New York City to guarantee universal representation for all immigrants in removal proceedings. New York City's NIFA program is a nationally recognized successful model for universal representation for detained immigrants. Today we propose that this model be expanded to non-detained individuals. The communities we represent are under greater attack than ever before. Our federal government is increasingly hostile to immigrants of all backgrounds, even those who are the most vulnerable and the, and the most in need. Um, the Trump administration is working to end DACA, TPS, asylum, and is waging a piecemeal war to slowly tear apart our nation's immigration system and deport as many of our neighbors as possible. It is New York City's responsibility to be a model city and a leader across the country for bold, smart initiatives that protect immigrants. A universal representation program for individuals in removal proceedings would vastly increase their likelihood of success in proceedings that are harder to win and more resource intensive every day. Without access to counsel, immigrants are forced to either represent themselves against trained government attorneys in one of the most complex areas of law or spend money many do not have to hire a private attorney. We urge the council to take this step in the face of unprecedented attacks from Washington. 
This new program will set the stage for replication across the country to fight back against the assaults on immigrant communities happening everywhere. Absent universal representation, what we know as a fact is that New Yorkers will continue to be deported, not because they lack a valid claim to status, but solely because they lack access to counsel. We also want to highlight the need for support for community-based emergency legal representation arising out of raids response work that many community-based organizations are engaged in. Every week, community members come through our doors to report a family member recently detained by ICE. This emergency support includes legal advice and counseling, time-sensitive bond hearings, preparation for reasonable fear interviews, filing motions to reopen for people with prior orders of deportation, and habeas petitions in federal court. This is work that requires legal resources and expertise on emergency timelines that most organizations are unable to provide. Um, we also support continued and expanded funding for um, two initiatives. Um, I'll just quickly say um, Knife Up, obviously, which is an incredibly successful program and faces more challenges than ever interfacing with EOIR and ICE. Um, and the city's support and flexibility in order to address each new challenge when fighting the de detention and deportation machine is more important than ever. And also the eye care program, we fully support the city council's endeavor to provide guaranteed representation for all unaccompanied minors. And I did also wanna ask the city council to resume its fight to oppose the criminal carve out. Thank you for your question just now. Um, we feel that limiting legal representation in this way stands in conflict with everything that we stand for as a community. We know you're on our side in this fight. Um, and we really just wanna reiterate um, that we know that this will cause families to be separated and um, individual, you know, people will lose breadwinners and parents. And this is a huge priority for us and our membership. Thank you very much. Sorry to go over time. Um, so Andrea and I are here to talk about Knife Up Together. She's gonna start. So I'm gonna start. go first so that we don't say, this is a whole coordinated yeah. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Andrea Sainz. I'm the attorney in charge of the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project team at Brooklyn Defender Services. And since 2014, we've been proud to have the council's support to work alongside the Legal Aid Society and the Bronx Defenders to represent over 3,000 detained immigrants who would have otherwise faced detention and deportation alone. Uh, having done detention work since 2008, I can tell you that detained deportation defense has always been time intensive, com complex, uh, adversarial and draining. However, it's also incredibly rewarding and meaningful. And under this administration, it's also now more difficult than ever. I wanna quickly touch on three aspects of how changes in court practice and policy have affected our work and made immigration court a more hostile place for immigrant New Yorkers, uh, even a part of how many of their cases there are. I'm focusing on the detained docket because I know other people will speak to what's happening at Federal Plaza. First, as you know, as of June, I stopped producing our clients in person to their own hearings and forced them to beam in via video conference, causing serious due process issues. Clients who can't understand uh, interpreters or their own hearings make eye contact with their own family members in the room or speak confidentially to their attorneys until we drive hours out to the jails. Second, the Department of Justice is exerting unprecedented political and job pressure on immigration judges to prioritize speed and deportations over due process, including case completion quotas, instructions to rush parents and children to final hearings uh, with or without counsel, and warnings to issue fewer continuances. And third, the Attorney General's issued new case law at an unprecedented rate, certifying long-standing cases to himself and replacing them with anti-immigrant decisions that strip judges' ability to close low priority cases and narrow or destroy grounds for asylum for people fleeing life-threatening violence that their governments will not protect them from. Um, and I regret to say that today's court of uh, victory doesn't apply to immigration court or it doesn't yet. So we're still fighting that fight. Um, and in addition, ICE counsel in New York do not exercise prosecutorial discretion to close cases. And um, on a daily basis, especially on the detained docket, almost never agree to release or grants of relief. In fact, they frequently appeal our victories, uh, requiring us to fully document and litigate nearly everything that we do and work on frequent appeals and federal court actions. All of these factors have made it harder and more resource intensive to provide the services that we now provide on the cases we already have and are continuing to intake every day, including today, under our contracts. 
and we look forward to speaking more with you about how to continue to provide high quality legal services to detain New Yorkers in the face of these challenges. Um, I know you're going to continue to hear a lot of bad news today, so I also wanted to take this time to say that my team at BDS is tired but not defeated, and we plan to stay in this fight for the liberty and the humanity of immigrants with your support. Thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Sarah Derry Oshiro, and I'm the Managing Director of the Immigration Practice at the Bronx Defenders. So I oversee our NAFA program and our PDEA practice. Um, and I'd like to thank the Council for its consistent and generous support of immigration legal services. Um, and as Andrea started to um, outline for the committee, we um, are faced with um, numerous different challenges right now to the delivery of legal services. And again, I'm also only going to be focusing on the issues we're seeing on the detained docket. Um, but in addition to the um, significant problems that have been caused by um, the refusal to produce our clients for in-person um, hearings and the, um, the ways in which we're seeing no prosecutorial discretion in our cases and, and in, in addition to the um, just, you know, every week it feels like there's a new terrible precedential decision from the Attorney General that are limiting our clients' uh, ability to um, have due process under the law and seek the protections that they're entitled to. Um, we're also seeing the indiscriminate enforcement in terms of who is being arrested by ICE. Um, we're seeing, um, as the commissioner was testifying on the previous panel, a, a stark increase in the sheer numbers of how many people are being arrested, and we're also seeing a spike in the numbers of people who have no criminal record whatsoever being arrested. Um, some of these are sometimes are referred to as collateral arrests, but ICE might go to one house looking for a particular person and pick up other individuals as well. And I think we can confidently say that under the previous uh, presidential administration, with a system of, of the um, priorities for whom they were prosecuting for removal, there were, we could sort of more safely say certain people were not as, as subject, as, as vulnerable to be arrested and put through proceedings, and we can't say that anymore. Um, and the other, I think, um, one other huge problem is the um, spike in courthouse arrests that we're seeing in New York City um, and outside of the city as well. But you know, in, in terms of what we're seeing here in New York City, um, this problem is it, it's, it's penalizing people who are responsibly attending court hearings. Um, this is a problem for immigrant community members and their families. Um, and it is exacerbating actually the court backlog and the, and the um, numbers of people who are in detention because essentially what they're pitting people's fear of deportation um, against somebody's desire to exercise their rights within the criminal justice system or any of the court systems. Um, and when people end up in ICE custody with open criminal cases, the impact on those, on those people and on the process is it, it um, prolongs the amount of time the case lasts because then those same people don't go forward with their deportation cases seeking bond or seeking relief because they can't, because the criminal case is opened. And you actually have instances where the public defender and the, and the district attorney are working together to get their clients produced back to the court to, to the jurisdiction in which they have a criminal case to resolve that case, and ICE won't honor those writs of production. So, you know, that, in addition to being a problem for the due process rights of the person who has to go to court or the witness or whatever it might be, it's also then um, creating more problems for the immigration proceeding to finish, and particularly to finish favorably because of the, those open cases. So, Can I um, ask about that one, one piece? Yeah. Is, is that... Um, uh, situation in which ICE will refuse to allow for the criminal open criminal case to be resolved is that is that essentially the final decision or is that is that can that be uh, challenged by a district attorney what happens when you get to that point I mean there are instances in which you can have a resolution of a particular case through like a paper plea if your client is still in ICE custody and you and you just cannot get ICE to pick them up and bring them to that court hearing um, that 
presumes that the client is willing to plead guilty to something for, for a paper plea. Um, but, you know, it's, it, it's not easy. And frankly, you know, not everybody wants to plead guilty and, and shouldn't have to. So um, I, I suppose theoretically there are court actions one could take in federal court maybe to seek a mandamus to compel ICE to produce that person. But again, that's staff capacity. Um, that we just don't have right now because we're just flooded in the immigration courts alone. And that's the point that I wanted to drive home, is that, that that's going to be the case over and over again, more and more, as people collateral and beyond are going to get picked up. And you need a lawyer to be able to have the capacity to follow that case and be able to advocate through the multiple courts that they need to to resolve all the different pieces to get a good resolution, a final just resolution, whatever that might be, mm -hmm. through the courts, period. Without a lawyer, you're, you're, you're you, you can't you can't do it without a lawyer. And um, you know, an, in addition to the problem of, of courthouse arrests in particular, yet another issue I think is like in the past two years, we've our our clients have lost the ability to seek Laura bond hearings from the immigration court, which just means that if somebody is subject to mandatory detention and not eligible for a bond, if you wanna even try to get a bond hearing, you have to go into federal court and file a habeas corpus petition, which um, at the volume that we're, we need to do that is, it, it's just, it is a huge challenge. Um, and those cases take months to adjudicate, hours and hours of time. It takes a specialization that it really needs to be um, keenly developed in particular staff. So that's another area I think that we're um, under a lot of pressure with. Um, and, thank you. And just, you know, thank you to the council for supporting this program. We, as Andrea said, we are, we are tired, but we're not giving up. Thank you, thank you for that, and, and, and to stay strong. And Knife Up is, is a jewel, is a jewel of a, of a, not just a program and initiative, but a life-changing, game-changing um, operation. And that's not a council thing, this is a community-driven, community concept uh, that had a lot of support. So we're, we're happy to do that. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Terry Lawson. I'm the director of the Family and Immigration Unit of Bronx Legal Services, the Bronx Office of Legal Services NYC. I also co-lead the Bronx Immigration Partnership, which is a collaboration of community-based organizations providing legal and social services uh, throughout the Bronx. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Legal Services NYC is grateful for the vital immigration funding it receives through the New York City's IOI, DOVE, CSBG, and in addition to the generous discretionary grants that we receive from council members. Through these programs and other funding, we provided legal assistance in 5,485 immigration cases, benefiting over 12,000 immigrants and their family members last year. And so far this year, we've opened over 1,200 uh, case, uh, cases, new cases for over 1,200 new clients, and are currently representing 71 immigrant youth in removal. City funding allows staff in our borough offices and outreach sites to meet with hard to reach community members, enabling them to come out of the shadows. Allow me to illustrate the importance of city council, uh, city council funding for immigration court representation through the story of one Garifuna woman I'll call Anna. Through the Bronx Immigration Partnership, Bronx Legal Services works closely with Garifuna Community Services and its leader, Gregoria Flores. As the council knows, and as you heard from uh, a young man today working with Safe Passage, there is a large Garifuna population with many recent Honduran arrivals in the Bronx. This summer, Anna and her 16-year-old daughter were connected with Garifuna Community Services after they arrived from the border. Gregoria reached out to Bronx Legal Services for help reuniting Anna and her 19-year-old daughter who was detained at the border. And in, at an event this fall with council member Salamanca, Gibson, Ayala, Torres, and other Bronx delegation members, Anna spoke in heartbreaking detail about the pain of being separated from her 19-year-old daughter and their efforts to reunite. With support from our social worker, Anna, a far Rockaway resident, was connected with Queens Legal Services, our Queens office. In the two weeks between Anna's impassioned speech and her intake appointment with Queens Legal Services, her 19-year-old daughter was deported, and an in absentia removal order was issued against her because the immigration court didn't give her notice of her hearing. 
A disturbing trend in an overloaded New York immigration court is to label arrivals of parents with children as FAMU and to require these families to appear for their first master calendar hearing within 30 days of being served with an NTA, permitting only one continuance of 30 to 45 days to find legal representation and requiring that their merits hearing be completed within five to six months. On top of this accelerated timeline, the immigration court frequently changes court dates, providing individuals and their counsel little to no warning, subjecting them to the very high risk of in absentia removal orders. When our social worker notified Queens Legal Services of the removal orders, Queens Legal Services Immigration Director Christina Velez quickly filed a motion to reopen. That motion was granted last month, and Queens Legal Services will be representing Anna and her younger daughter in immigration court on their asylum applications. Without city funding, our representation of Anna and her daughter and the hundreds of other immigrants we stand with in immigration court would not be possible. At the same time that we applaud the city for the vital funding, we feel the pain of all that we cannot do, wondering whether more funding could have helped us to stop the deportation of Anna's older daughter from in Texas. We ask the city council to continue to fund immigration court representation as well as critical social work services for, for New York's nonprofit community. We are stronger together and with the city council's support, we will fill the halls of New York's immigration court with talented, bright, fearless advocates and social workers who will do everything possible to protect immigrant New Yorkers regardless of when they arrived. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Menchaca and the other members of the committee for convening this very important hearing today. And thank you also for such a warm welcome for uh, Axel earlier uh, this afternoon. Uh, he was pretty excited. He was delighted on his way out. So thank you for giving him that opportunity to tell a very important story. My name is Rich Limesider. I'm the executive director of the Safe Passage Project, and we're a nonprofit organization based here in New York that does only one thing. We provide free lawyers to refugee children who are being deported. Uh, Safe Passage was founded in 2013 with a half-time staff person, a small budget, uh, working alongside many of the organizations in this room in response to what was called the surge of unaccompanied minors arriving in New York. And we will end 2018 with 28 staff working with more than 400 pro bono attorneys, supported by a $2.4 million budget, and uh, having the privilege of representing more than 800 children in removal proceedings at New York's Immigration Court. Today I want to talk about three things. One, I want to give a little bit more uh, context and data and uh, chime in with uh, the very able and thoughtful testimony you've already heard. I want to share a little bit of good news about what's been possible because of the support of the council and the city over the past few years. And I want to uh, add my voice to uh, the encouragement, uh, thanks for the support so far, encouragement to continue that support, and especially to chime in um, excitedly about this conversation on universal representation and how we can work together to move towards that very important goal. So data from the TRAC program at Syracuse, which has been referenced earlier today, says that without an attorney, unaccompanied minors at New York's immigration court will win their case only 17% of the time. And that's data that goes back almost 15 years based on their monthly FOIAs. They're unable to argue for the protections that they actually qualify for, and more than 80% of children are issued removal orders. The federal government is increasingly sophisticated in its administrative and procedural obstacles to this work, and there's a whole alphabet soup that's going on these days, RFEs, NOIDs, NOIRs, uh, requests for evidence, notice of intent to deny, uh, notice of intent to revoke uh, status that's previously been granted. In one recent example with Safe Passage Project, um, we had been pursuing relief for one of our clients based on a law that offers protection for children who've been abandoned by their parents. And in this case, the government rejected our, the federal government rejected our claim because the children's parents had died. And the government wanted to argue that that didn't constitute abandonment. So this is the sort of administrative obstacle that we're now facing. We are still generally winning most of these cases. When we get to the end of the case, we often see a positive outcome, 
but it takes longer than it ever did before. And so when the child does have an attorney, the statistics are exactly the opposite. We see that 80% of children who do have an attorney by their side will win their case. Um, and I'll just finish up by saying that, you know, we know that together we can do more. The support of the Council for the Eye Care Program, bringing together a coalition of providers, has made a tremendous difference. We encourage the, uh, the full support and full funding of that program. We agree that um, the Council should continue to advocate to oppose the criminal carve-out, and we'd love to work together with the Council and the administration to figure out how to make universal representation a reality. Thank you. Well, there's really only one person that needs to get convinced, and his name is, <laughs> his name is Bill de Blasio. And he happens to be the mayor of this great city, uh, and, and so I, I think he's the only one that's really <coughs> blocking this, and so we'll, we'll figure out a way uh, to create that pressure point. Um, and as we build that narrative, I want to ask a little bit about how, uh, and, and Rich, maybe I'll start with you. You really make it clear that there's a mission uh, to get to 2020 uh, and have no child in NYC uh, face deportation in immigration court. And so how do we, how do we get there? What's the plan for safe passage? What, what does that look like? Uh, we talked a lot about the mechanism of, uh, or the different kind of components of mechanism for universal representation. One of them is the actual apparatus itself, you all as providers, uh, and then there's the funding gap. Clearly we saw a year where there wasn't enough spend down and there was money left over, thank goodness, but to help me understand as a team here, uh, one for, for Safe Patch, this Passage 2020, and then for the whole, really for the whole panel, what can we help you with in determining the things that are most critical to getting you there, capacity-wise, funding-wise, the contract. I know, I know we're engaging in open communication on a negotiation. That's a back and forth. I get that, but we're partners. We're 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 with we're with you, um, and and in tandem with the city itself, we have the opportunity to advocate. And so, tell us what do we need to do. I'll just very briefly say that the flexibility that many of my colleagues have spoken about is really important. I think we can continue to work together. We can uh, build data models and we can talk about exactly how many uh, immigrants we're, we're speaking of. Safe Passage is more able to talk to unaccompanied minors, to children, but uh, who are not in detention, not in the detained setting. Uh, but we can build that, uh, that understanding. But the flexibility to understand that each of the providers brings different strengths and different models. For example, some providers come with a direct representation model. All the clients are served by staff attorneys. Others work more broadly with pro bonos. There are different strengths that different models can bring, and it's, um, it's uh, helpful when the city can understand and appreciate that we may bring different levels of uh, numbers of supervising attorneys, uh, different sort of approaches to how we do the work, but as long as we're getting the job done together, if there's that flexibility in the funding, we can get to those numbers a lot faster. And the flexibility has changed for the better, question mark, and I guess I want to get a sense about, let's just stick on that topic on flexibility and the contracts as they've moved through time. Uh, we, and, and Commissioner Banks did reference a moment where there was real conversation, and I remember those conversations where we wanted to build something that was both robust in the number of dollars, but really thinking about flexibility. And, and, and then there was conversations about staff uh, or, or kind of um, pay rates and uh, contracts that were multi-year. So there's a lot of different pieces to it. So tell us a little bit about where we are on flexibility, where we need to go on flexibility. I'll say a few words on that. Um, specifically on IOI, I think, um, you know, IOI's been absolutely critical. It's allowed many, many organizations to vastly expand services for immigrant New Yorkers. And I think um, the administration has had some increasing flexibility around some really important pieces of that contract to allow us to adjust to new challenges, um, address, you know, new patterns that we're seeing in immigration court. A couple of things where there's been less flexibility that I think are really critical. One is um, the cap on matters per participant. Um, so there, you know, they have imposed a restriction on the number of cases, quote unquote, that each person can have. Um, and we heard, you know, in Commissioner Banks' testimony today, he, he, you know, I was delighted to hear that he understands that someone in removal proceedings can have multiple other cases at the same time. 
Um, we also, that contract, a lot of people forget that it also covers employment cases. Um, so many of our organizations have a holistic model where someone comes in the door because they may, you know, be eligible for some form of immigration relief, which in itself could be two, three, four, or five cases. And then they also have wage theft and they're facing discrimination by their employer. And we can only enroll two of those cases on that contract. So that, that is crucial. And we've raised it and we're in contract negotiations as they mentioned and we're talking about it. But I mean, I think that's a huge priority for many of the providers. And then the other piece is um, we're doing a lot of things these days, all of us, that we haven't normally done. Um, because we're, there are new things happening, you know, coming out of Washington. So, for example, we are all doing a ton of habeas litigation in federal court, or we're bringing like massive federal actions on behalf of our clients who are facing newfangled fraud schemes and other types of things. Um, there's been very little flexibility to count those cases on the IOI contract. So for example, we represent 33 New Yorkers who were defrauded by an immigration attorney and have been placed in the deportation pipeline. And we have like a massive team of attorneys on that case and it counts as one case on IOI. And we're, you know, it's like huge. So that type of flexibility has, has been difficult. Um, and then on the, on the contract itself, like the mechanism, um, I think one challenge in terms of capacity, and this came up earlier, is that the, the, money, the funding is a case rate funding. So the more money you get, the more cases you do. And as we all expand our programs, we need space, we need to hire supervisors, we need overhead, we need to buy a copier if we have five new lawyers. You know, all these things, there's nowhere to charge those expenses. Um, and so, you know, I think really looking at what it takes to build capacity at organizations beyond how many more cases can we do for this funding is important. Is there a cap to the uh, the supervisory attorneys? There's not a there's not a cap. It's just that you don't the all of the money comes with cases. So if you want to hire a supervisor to supervise five attorneys, they're not going to be able to have a full caseload. And so I think we all struggle with that. Can I just add two things quickly on while we're on IOI, and then I'm sure there's more to be said about NIFA. Um, two quick things. We agree wholeheartedly about the stacking cap and its sort of limitation on what we can report. Um, but also another piece of that is what we can re-enroll each mm -hmm. year. So there's a limitation on how many cases we can re-enroll each year. And as the cases get longer and longer, as the dockets get longer and longer, and the cases get put out two and three and four years for a hearing, we're still doing work on those cases, but when there starts to be limitations on what we can re-enroll, when we, our, our caseloads will just keep getting larger, but the, what we can report and get credit for gets smaller. So that's a big um, issue for us that will come up in, in contract negotiations. Uh, the other thing, sorry. Well, but before you go to the second thing, so how do we solve that? I mean, we, our position has been as providers that we should get paid for the work that we do, um, regardless. Amen. Of <laughs> yes. Regardless of some calculation that was created about what we what we should be reporting, if we're doing the work, no matter how many cases we're doing for a client, we're we're putting in the hours, and we should get paid for that. Um, same thing with supervision. So you know, as we are supervising these cases, um, we should get paid for that, and it shouldn't always be a per case rate. Um, so that, and then I just, the last other thing, Amy alluded to this, but in terms of putting in something into the contract for space, you know, trying to find the money for the rent and for paralegal support and social worker support, these are all things, especially when we're representing more and more kids, if you don't have really a robust team of social workers, it becomes really hard um, to work with children and to be able to get the information that you need to be successful on their cases. And, and, and for organizations, do you feel like you have a plan that you can propose that says, as we grow, there's a, um, a formula uh, that says, as, as the number of clients grows, the space need will be X as we move. Is that something that can be developed? Uh, and if it can, I'd like to have that as we move into negotiations for the budget. Okay. Um, and, th and, and I think that there's, there's, and I like categories, there's a category of kind of capital investment that's a one-time buy, um, and then the, the kind of maintenance, 
uh, copiers, one thing, I, well, actually, I don't even know how copiers are, are bought these days. Maybe it's a lease. I don't know. I guess what I'm saying is, is there, is there something right now that can bring relief to you as you expand? And then what's the, what's the kind of year-to-year -year need yeah. that we can build into the contract? And one last thing um, that hasn't been brought up yet, but our fee waiver applications are all getting denied. Um, and so we're going to start, we're going to need a fund to help pay, pe pay people's fees to USAIS. And these are huge fees. Um, and USAIS has just been denying our fee waiver applications left and right. So if the council can c help us with develop a fund for that, that would help us um, to, to pay those application fees. Got it. Yeah. We, that, those are the kind of things we need to, to hear and that are our barrier for, for representation. So um, I would echo what um, Amy and Terry have said. Um, and also just going back to the point about flexibility in the middle of a contract year, um, I would be remiss not to mention that like this minute as we speak this week, Knife Up is undergoing a, a huge crisis of um, how our clients or our future clients are being calendared all of a sudden at 26 Federal Plaza instead of at Varick Street. We have you know, systems in place that are now five years old of how each provider staffs the Varick Street courtrooms every week. We have systems, we have staff ready to go who are there present. Uh, yes, to, um, today is Wednesday. <laughs> today is Wednesday. You know, today there was one knife up client picked up at Varick. And why is that? Everybody is currently at 26 Federal Plaza, essentially getting funneled through rocket dockets that we are not staffing because we don't have the capacity to just all of a sudden send eight attorneys to 26 Federal Plaza when we have another eight attorneys scheduled for Varick today. Um, the immigration court is telling us they just want people to have the opportunity to go home for Chris, to have the opportunity to have a bond hearing before Christmas. Um, nobody's having bond hearings. In fact, we have pro bonos volunteering there as we speak, asking those judges at 26 Federal Plaza to please reset them over for Varick Street intake days. So, I mean, this is um, an issue that's going to be ongoing as we see the immigration court um, trying to address the backlog. Um, it is, in fact, valuable to address the backlog. The Bronx offenders just sued about the delay in how long you have to wait between when you're arrested by ICE and when you first see an immigration judge. But um, just opening up courts from one day to the next with no advance notice, no ability to have the providers prepare accordingly so that we can get the money to hire the people to staff these these dockets, that's a, it's a problem of um, epic proportions and we need the flexibility to have emergency infusions of cash into our services in the middle of a contract year. Um, and yeah. Have you asked for resources to address this problem from the administration? So this, this kind of just happened. Right. Um, so we'd love to follow up with you about that ASAP. Okay. Yes. Um, and this so is, this is incredibly concerning. Yes, and so we had learned literally weeks ago that um, EOIR is you know, nearing completion on, cons on construction of new courtrooms at the Varick Street building, um, and that they are planning to open those as of February, and that at least two of those courtrooms will be detained courtrooms. So we just learned that information and had just started to talk within ourselves. We need to talk to the administration. We need to talk to our, you know, our directors to figure out how, how many new cases would that be? How many dollars would that be? How many staff would that be? So we're literally putting that together now. And then we had kind of this drama this week, which we think we're going to mostly overcome through like sheer teamwork and volunteer power. Um, but the bigger, the bigger thing that's coming down the road is that EOIR is about to increase the detained docket. And they're going to do that not on July 1, but in February. And so, you know, as you well, know. Well, essentially, it's kind of happening now. Right. So, but we, we, just think, we think that what's happening this week is not going to happen every week until February. We think. We're in communication with them. Um, but we do, we do know that they are planning to more permanently staff more judges on the detained docket. Um, and and so, help clarify yeah. the, the, the video conferencing uh, move yeah. from from ICE and whether or not the video conferencing will continue with these two, uh, with these two court, the, the two courts, courtrooms that they're opening up. I, I assume so. I mean, we continue to, you know, 
try to figure out everything we can do to bring our clients back. But my understanding is that both ICE and EOIRC video conferencing is sort of the wave of the future. We all have to get with the program. And so that um, they would, I assume, run video uh, hearings with all, all of their new courtrooms, um, assuming they have the technology to do so, which has been a problem for the last five months. They haven't had the actual lines to run enough hearings, and that's caused immense delay on the detained docket. Hence the lawsuit that is really pushing for for a, uh, a decrease in the, in the, the time of detention. And so their response is, great, we'll put more courtrooms. We'll put them on when, put, we'll put the cases on when you're not there. We'll put them on without telling people. I mean, this affects the private bar as well. There are court you know, hearings right. happening this week that no one knew were happening. So we are trying very hard to get it under control. And you know, I think with the full court press, we're gonna you know, hopefully be able to plan far enough ahead of time that we can get more lawyers there. And what can the city do to provide a resource for you or is this something that just the, pro the providers you're kind of embedded into the system you need funding I hear that very clear and we'll get a sense about exactly what kind of funding you need for this right. emergency response but is there anything in a role that we can play at a city municipal level in this court that's federal and immigration and civil but not in our jurisdiction what can we do what can I do hmm. to support this and you don't need to have an answer now, sure. but I'm just offering <laughs> Absolutely. everything that we I mean, can the, do. The, the smallest and easiest thing to do, which um, has already started because we let HRA know about some of these docketing issues we were having um, because they were affecting intake, is that is to uh, reach out to ICE and EOIR in New York to let them know that you are monitoring the situation and that you're concerned about the way that you know due process is, is happening, you know, or not happening in New York, and even if even if you don't have the power to direct them, I think it's very powerful in the same way when you bring observers and you bring you know people who are accompanying people to watch the court, which I know you've been there, um, that that's powerful and that puts people sometimes on better behavior. Um, so I think if I think we want to continue to have the city partner with us in talking to the agencies and saying like. You know, we all need to have meetings. We need to talk to each other. We need to hear when is the courtroom opening. How you know we need to plan so that we can get some more information. Got it. And I know that both I, uh, as chair, and the mayor's office sent a letter uh, yes, when the you. first cases, uh, when it became clear that the cases uh, being heard were going to be teleconferenced through television. And so, um, here's here's the the the. the the next question I have is really about, about this world, if we can't change the teleconferencing, and what happens to the need for more lawyers that are traveling now, and now you're essentially paying for their travel time, and like what happens in an ecosystem where, where that doesn't change? I, I don't see that changing. We're going we're gonna to move towards incredible pressure to change that, right. but in the meantime, how, how does that change the need for more lawyers that are able to kind of be present uh, in, in a world where the docket can be determined the morning of uh, while in detention. How does that, you're, you're closer to it, so what does that do to the need for lawyers? I mean, it in, there's an increased need for staff attorneys that are doing the work because there's only so many hours in the work week and you know, to your point, yes, it does take more time to make those trips to do an initial screening, even just to tell somebody that they don't have relief, right? That can take a half day of an attorney's time, whereas it used to take an hour in the morning on the day of. So there's definitely a need for just, um, you know, having a, a larger pool of money to hire the attorneys to do the work. But then going back to Amy's point before about funding um, work that's not just the direct legal services in immigration court, but the, the litigation efforts to sue the federal agencies whose policies are having such a detrimental impact on our client population. Like, it's harder to fund impact litigation services, but, you know, somebody might need to sue over VTC in the near future because we don't, you know, because that policy hasn't stopped despite our attempts to meet with ICE and to, you know, explain to them what we think is so legally problematic about this, about these policies. So, you know, currently the, the lawsuit that the Bronx Defenders brought about um, the initial presentment um, 
the you know unlawful practices of detaining people on average 80 days before they see an immigration judge that's not funded under the knife up budget but it's impacting all of our knife up clients so i think taking a broader view of what funding immigration legal services um, might entail given how necessary it is to bring these federal lawsuits it could be a way to to move forward as well Got it. including litigation on ice and courts litigation on fee waivers i mean it's it, the list is right. endless right right and that's another request to what's 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 the price tag on suing the federal government <laughs> on all the all the cases that uh, have yet to kind of go and do we have the capacity to do that i think i think pro part of the larger conversation that we're having here is how do we how do we bring lawyers in front of people so that we can have that representation but the system itself is changing and we got we got to figure out a constraint it so it doesn't change um for the worse and when it does we can sue them and win and and that's our prerogative. That's that's the municipal government role. Right. Uh, and um, and I, I dare anyone to say different. Uh, and so how do we how do we make that case? But we, we're going to need a budget request, right. and that's coming up soon. So it'd be great to kind of figure out where and how you're prioritizing what what lawsuits we we can focus on, and and what kind of resources we can bring from our own council as well and join you in these lawsuits exactly. uh, through, through, um, through time. Uh, and that's another kind of visibility. We're watching you and we're also suing you. Uh, <laughs> and and that's, that's the power that we can, that we can bring. Uh, and I, I'll have to talk to the lawyers to see how, how that works internally, but I think that's the that's initiative that I wanna, I wanna make clear that we wanna do and support you. But we gotta understand the plan that you're leading and how we can support that. Any other items that you want to point to to kind of give, give us a sense about need? I know there are a lot of other service providers I want to, want to talk, but I want to make sure any other last minute things. And thanks for alerting us of the of the court the courtrooms at Barrick, yep. and even just this week, uh, clients being moved to 26 Federal Plaza, and <laughs> and and how ridiculous that is, and and contrary to due process. And they're going to do everything they can. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank to, you. to this panel. Okay, we're gonna get through the next panels. Uh, we have a few more panels to go, and two more panels. Two more panels, and we have here uh, Hassan, uh, Legal Aid Society, uh, from NILAG, Lauren, Reef, Camille Mackler, New York Immigration Coalition, Franco Torres, the Catholic Charities Community Services, and Mark. Valinotti, uh, Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation, please. This is going to be a fun panel. I'm ready. Don't hold anything back. <laughs> Hassan, do you want to start? Sure. So good afternoon. I'm Hassan Shafikullah, the attorney in charge of the Immigration Unit at the Legal Aid Society. The previous panel covered a lot of the things I was going to say, and so I don't want to repeat a lot of it, but I might. Give us the fiery, give us the, the what do we need to do? Just a word about the 170, the, the criminal carve out. And so <clears throat> the, my understanding of the administration's position on the 170 is that they will honor an ICE detainer for somebody who has one of 170 convictions, which means that if I'm in New York custody and I'm about to be released, they'll give ICE a 48-hour heads up, or give them an, an opportunity to lodge a detainer so I can be held for 48 hours. And they, they will honor um, that detainer request if one is lodged. So I get that, that the, that the city is cooperating to that extent. So, I, But I have two points that I want to make about that. One is, most of the clients that we're seeing in IOI um, and in IFAP and in iCare and all the other f um, funding streams that, are, that have been infected by the 170 carve out are not folks that are coming directly out of New York custody. And so the detainer law shouldn't actually apply. The way that the administrative code is written, it's just for people who are in custody who are about to be released. And so if they want to go by the strict reading of the admin code, fine, but it doesn't apply. But it's actually not fine, because even if it were to apply, and if I'm going directly into ICE custody, if 
Congress, in the Immigration Nationality Act, provided forms of relief that might allow me to get status notwithstanding my conviction, don't tie the provider's hands. You might not like that immigrant if we're gonna go into a bad immigrant narrative, but if, if we have tools in the immigration laws to fight for those people, let us do it. Okay. Um, a couple points I wanted to say on other things. Um, the City Bar Association's task force on the civil right to counsel just passed a, or issued a statement yesterday about the right to counsel for children in removal proceedings. These are some of the most vulnerable folks um, facing deportation, and I encourage the city to really consider is, you know, this should be the moment that we say, kids should not be facing deportation by themselves, and we really need to make sure that there's an attorney for everybody, um, for any child. Um, in the in the NIFAP context, with video conferencing and with the, the crazy dockets that are going on, we are going to be coming to the city for, for more resources to meet that need because it's going to be incredibly challenging. There's no way for us to provide universal representation, which is what the city council has allowed us to do for the last several years, um, without without additional resources. We just can't do m so much more with just the number of people that we have already, and so just. As we get into budget season, that'll be one of the big asks that are out there. Um, we're doing a lot of habeases um, to get people out of prolonged detention or to stop um, deportations at the last minute. We're doing a lot of class actions. We're doing affirmative litigation. Federal work is expensive, and that's another thing that we'll be asking for. And I know you're, you had flagged that, and you're like, what does that cost? And we'll be telling you what that costs, and, and we hope to have your support. In things like Iowa. Well, let's go back with habeas really quick. Yeah. So tell, tell us a little bit about <coughs> any data that you have on spikes. And, and that, that'll be a question, too, for everyone else. What is that spike? Are we talking about an exponential spike in habeas um, cases? And what, what does that do to the, the caseload? How does that change so, the, I mean, it, it, the apparatus? There's, yeah, there's, there's so many more clients for whom we're seeking to do it, and it's because of a range of factors. The changing enforcement priorities, you don't get prosecutorial discretion. ICE isn't going to consent to release people. They're going to fight, even on cases that we've won. So we had a, a client where the judge terminated proceedings because um, they couldn't establish removability, but ICE was um, appealing, and they, and they fought us tooth and nail, and we had to like, go and do a habeas to get this person out of, out of detention. Yeah. Um, and we've had a citizen client where we showed with convincing evidence that he had derived citizenship through one of his parents, um, and they still wouldn't release him. We had to do a habeas even for that, for someone over whom the immigration court has no jurisdiction. Um, so they're fighting us tooth and nail on cases that should be straightforward, and on the, the tougher ones, they're certainly fighting us. And so we're having to go into the federal courts in ways that we, at, at a volume that we never had to do before, with no new resources. And so with IOI, um, the, the stacking cap, um, which Terry talked about, where if I'm doing multiple forms of relief for a client, let's say I'm in removal proceedings, I'm seeking asylum, but this person was also um, abused by her partner, so we're seeking a U visa and a waiver of inadmissibility grounds. So there's multiple things that we're doing. We can only build two of those. And so the stacking limitation makes no sense. If we're doing complex work and doing multiple forms of relief to try to maximize the person's chance of success, pay us for that work. And also the, the re-enrollment limitations, that these cases, the city is, um, I think, properly really emphasizing removal defense, which is great, but these cases, we all know, don't end in two years. They don't end in three years. They might at last several years in the normal course, and with BIA appeals and all that, it's gonna take even longer. Um, and so to have a limit on the number of times we can re-enroll it if we're still doing the work doesn't make any sense. Again, just pay us for the work that we're doing. And just to echo what others have said, build in social work support in, in these grants, um, build in space, um, and money for fees. We did a GoFundMe campaign to try to raise some money for filing fees. We're getting um, denials on fee waiver requests, and on certain things you have the luxury of trying, and maybe the client can like scrounge money together. But if it's an appeal and you only have a certain amount of time, you don't have the luxury of trying. Um, and so we're, we're paying for these clients, but it's, our funds are limited. We're a nonprofit, and so, um, so we're looking for help from the city on that as well. And with What's that the cost of a, of a fee? So it, it can be as, as little as like 400, or it could be as high as um, almost 1,900 if I'm trying to prove citizenship. Um, and that's a judge, or derivation. the discretion of the judge. Certain things cannot be waived at all. Other things can be waived at the discretion of usually USCIS. Some of them are oh. at the discretion of an immigration judge. Okay, I'll stop there, thanks.
Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Chaka, and thank you for having me. My name is Lauren Reef. I'm a supervising attorney at the New York Legal Assistance Group. Um, I would like to keep my remarks to things that have not already been discussed, but I do want to emphasize that NILAG also agrees with many of the comments that have been made and many of the concerns that have been raised by other providers, um, in particular regarding um, the case stacking uh, limitation and the limitations on re-enrollment, and as well as the fees, um, that we need help paying fees. One particular um, issue that's, that's come up is that not only are all cases, affirmative and defensive, becoming significantly more complex um, as a result of changes in policy and changes of the level of effort that is put into uh, trying to prosecute people or uh, scrutinize their applications. Um, uh, we now have to assume that any case we undertake is going to require extremely increased time and preparation um, and may in almost any case now ultimately lead to removal if an application is denied. Um, in particular, the administration has issued guidance that uh, humanitarian cases like U visas, BAWA, um, T visas, if an application is denied um, in the absence of some reason they see to exercise their discretion, uh, they will be putting all people who are not in authorized status and whose application has been denied in immigration court. So now, pretty much any case we take on, affirmative or defensive, we have to see it as potentially a defensive case, um, which is a lot um, to undertake. In addition, changes in policy, for example, the special immigrant juvenile status um, issue we've seen recently where they suddenly the government has reversed course on whether you can qualify that if you're over 18 but under 21. Um, uh, we're now looking at these people, if they're not already in removal, being put in removal when their case is denied. And because the policy was changed so abruptly, we're looking at a need to do appeals in order to try and protect these people. And that is expensive um, to do those appeals, which are not based on anything that we could have predicted at the time we first accepted the case. Um, so we are asking that the council consider um, the increased demands on our services, um, the increased time and resources that we need to put in each and every case um, in, in its budgeting. Um, I do know that you wanted me to mention that um, I, representatives from, from our legal health uh, division, which works with health and hospitals, um, testified recently at a uh, hearing on public charge, um, and they've certainly seen some impact. There's fear um, and misunderstandings in immigrant communities, and people are uh, making choices contrary to their um, own interests in terms of their health um, and in terms of their ability to feed their families um, out of fear that they might no longer be eligible for benefits. So um, in terms of the impacts that might have on, on people's vulnerability to bad actors, um, as well as the need for information to be um, spread, the, the true information about what impacts might exist, um, we'd ask for the council's help in that as well. And one quick follow-up question. The, 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 um, the denials for something like SIG uh, that you're seeing and then the appeal process that you said is really expensive. Is that able to be renegotiated in the current contract? Um, uh, Hassan talked a little bit about, about the fact that you can only kind of go back a couple times uh, for, or maybe it was in the, lar the previous panel, where you can only, uh, a, a case becomes limited or capped. In the case of a SIG uh, case, denial, and then is that part of, can you, can you attach that to an IOI contract today? Sure, um, so if you have taken, it's sort of two separate issues um, I wanna address Yeah, can you response. unpack that for, for us, Yeah, for absolutely. Me? So um, for SIG clients, um, generally speaking, there's um, two or three steps to the process, right? There's uh, the family court process of, of having a guardian or a custodial parent um, recognized and the special findings order entered. Um, 
Then there's the process of applying for the status on the basis of what the family court founds with immigration. Um, and there may be a removal component to that as well, um, where you need to go into immigration court and say this is what we're applying for and um, uh, advocate to not have a removal order issued um, pending a determination on eligibility for that relief. Um, so the case cap means that we, if we then also had to do an appeal for that same client, um, we would be limited out on the number of cases we can bill. Um, so that would not be done under IOI. We would not be able to, to get um, payment for, for that extra work. But the other issue is the fee attached that you have to submit. You have to, there's a filing fee that you, in order to file an appeal in many cases that immigration won't even consider your appeal. They won't take it unless you've paid them. Mm -hmm. um, and when the appeal comes as a result of a uh, change in policy, it doesn't matter, you still have to pay the fee. So we have minor clients who are needing, you know, they're between the ages of 18 and 21, they may be working, they may be in school, and in order to try to advocate for them further and say this policy changes the problem and just preserve any further line of defense for them, um, that filing fee becomes an option. It's $675. Um, for each client who wishes to make an appeal, and that's just for the government to even look at it. And the only editorial note that I want to make here is we heard from the administration that they're okay giving a screening. They're not okay with following up with a full case for X reason, X or Y reason. And then here we get to a point where we're, we're saying, the administration is saying, yes, we'll give you a case, but as complicated as it can get, there's a limit. And once someone gets connected to the city of New York, they should have the entire process not only paid for, but cared for and, and holistically approached. It just the idea of, of someone kind of walking onto a cliff and we're kind of saying, sorry, bureaucratic issues, budget issues, we're not committed to the to, to the, the full length of case and the multiple courts that we have to go to support one New Yorker. Um, it just, anyway, thank you for, Absolutely. for walking it. If I may comment on that, we as lawyers cannot in good conscience say that, well, we can only bill two cases, so we're only gonna do two cases, even yeah, if you qualify for not. five, which, you know, ethically, that's a problem for us. So basically what that means is that in, in a case where someone might have five individual cases and they're only one participant, yeah. um, much of our work is unfunded, which impacts our ability to meet our deliverables. And ethically, nor should the city of New York. <laughs> Next. Hi. Um, good afternoon. My name is Franco Torres, and I'm the Special Projects Attorney at Catholic Charities. I just want to also start by reiterating a lot of the similar concerns that have already been expressed in terms of needing um, support for federal litigation. Um, they're making us work a lot more. Um, harder and on every single front and as they as they have um, Have said over and over again. Um, it's hard to account for that in in the current contracts We have people with multiple matters and like we said ethically. We're gonna we're gonna take that work on um, but um Thank you for allowing me to testify today um, about the needs um, and gaps in services for New York's immigrants. Um, Catholic Charities has been committed to welcoming New, York, New York's immigrants, and this commitment is rooted in our respect for human dignity of each person and the value he or she brings to our community. Um, Catholic Charities serves uh, individuals in all five boroughs. 50% uh, of our clients are New York City residents. 20% of those are minors. Um, our goal our goal is to basically take um, some of the existing networks that we have and strengthen those and then add to those um, in the next cycle. Um, we'd like to encourage ongoing developing initiatives um, basically to build proactive and nuanced response and referral systems through the existing collabor collaborative models that we have. So Action NYC, ICARE, IOI, ICH, and IIRAC. We also want to look at enhancing the direct representation structures that already exist, increasing pro bono and pro se services for rapid response efforts, and also addressing emergent um, legal needs. Um, as been discussed um, earlier today, for the past two years, um, immigrant communities have faced countless shifts in policy, um, affecting um, basically pretty much every form of relief, 
and attacks on the main pillars of the immigration system, family unity, safety for survivors of violence, uh, stability for communities in crisis. And New York City has strived to meet this immigrant need through holistic responses, um, marrying local communities with respective providers. Um, we're encouraging refining and nuancing these networks to increase efficacy, reduce duplicate services, and grow a holistic connectivity across um, the different facets of service delivery to meet immigrant needs. Uh, specifically, we're looking at um, using the Action NYC hotline as a referral conduit and as a means to coordinate capacity updates between the different legal service providers so we can mitigate wait times for people who are trying to come into the system and seek consultations. Um, we'd like to incorporate New York City support for the Immigration Help Desk to coordinate consultations and referrals. Um, that right now is a federally funded program, um, but basically it's a, it's a huge source of intakes. It's through the Immigration Court, it services 10 months, um, uh, 10 days a month, um, basically um, doing intakes and screening people at the Immigration Court before or after their hearings um, and giving them information. But the teleconferencing has kind of stopped that. Or we're talking about detain and non, you're talking about I'm non talking about non, I, I'm, I'm talking about non-detain because right. knife up takes care of the Got detain. It. So right. this is a non-detain. Non Although we've had our own challenges in them creating the courtrooms, they took away the space that we were using for that. So we were literally yeah. doing it in the hallway um, with like three makeshift desks. Um, but um, in the end, this in-depth coordination, it's gonna take experience, time, thought, and effort, and we're looking for funding for co coordination roles that allow a heightened awareness of um, on-the-ground needs, um, finding greater efficacy in delivering services. Um, and so in terms of broadening um, the legal responses, we're looking for help in terms of recruiting, training, and deploying volunteers um, to supplement um, our services address the logistical support needs for legal casework, so that can be anything like finding um, psychological evaluations or assistance for survivor victims, people who are in asyl um, asylum proceedings who can use that um, to support and strengthen their case, and basically connect and collaborate with other organizations to identify community needs. And just to wind down, you can read in more detail in the written testimony, but we're looking at expanding the immigration court help desk. As you guys have talked, it's not criminal court. You don't get, you don't get a free lawyer assigned. And so as a result, many people are navigating this process without counsel. And so the immigration court help desk um, provides an orientation. Um, it provides a tutorial and pro se services. Um, and we'd also like to get into the federal litigation. Got it. And before Camille goes, I want to ask this last question about Catholic Charities. Uh, <coughs> and Rich kind of said this earlier, organizations have very specific uh, uh, strengths about their kind of entry into this world of, of legal, service, um, legal services. And I'm thinking about the jails, uh, the detention centers, where they are right now in different parts of the state uh, and across the river in the other state and where their Catholic charities, um, I mean, I'm like, I'm brainstorming out loud here and maybe we should do it off, offline, but I'm thinking about what you do already for non-detained and the kind of need for a kind of detained service like Knife Up and, and working with not, a nonprofit that has, ha, you're everywhere, Catholic yeah. Charities is everywhere to provide that service for, um, for folks who are, who are detained and getting access to them at their jails and working with you to think about how we can we can do that. Yeah, our organization is already thinking about entering into okay. entering to that That's because wonderful. we get we get a lot of calls actually from local parishes. We'll get something from Father John out in Middletown yeah. about a local family that has had this happen where somebody is taken to detention and right. we now route those we we route those through NIFA but that's that's right. something that we have we have. It could be robust. It could be funded. It could be yeah. connected. And unfortunately, uh, I think this is going to continue to be. A oh yeah, I I don't. Yeah. It's going to get worse. Yeah. And on that note, Camille. Uh, I can speak fast if you want. No <laughs> that was a joke. So, <laughs> give, give us everything we need to hear. Um, I've, I obviously, first of all, thank you for the opportunity, and I obviously echo and I could never say better than what these providers have said today. Um, but I do want to actually piggyback on some of the things that you have mentioned. And I want, New York City has, to my knowledge, made the largest municipal investment in immigration legal services anywhere in the country. 
Um, and New York State has one of the largest state fund, um, if you include what the city has invested, has one of the largest, if not the largest, state investment. Um, so I think now is time for us to start pushing ourselves to think about more. How do we get to universal representation? How do we think outside the box? How do we use the phenomenal energy and power and knowledge um, that we have here in New York City and here in New York State? And how do we start moving the conversation on universal representation, the needle on that? Because it's going to start those conversations, things are changing in DC, right? Starting in two weeks, we're gonna start having more oversight, we're gonna start having more questions being asked. There are rumblings of independent immigration courts, there are rumblings of access to council issues going on down there, and we wanna make sure that when those start happening, they point the finger right here at New York City and they say, that's how you do it. That's how we do it. We, you know about our immigration lawyer army, you know we get together once a month and we talk about these issues, they talk about it all the time in between. Um, where we're constantly channeling the energy. These are some of the most passionate, dedicated people. And I think, Lauren, you know, there, it's true, we have ethical obligations to see our cases through, but I've never seen a lawyer in this room or outside this room walk away from a case. Um, and to your point about how do we do this around the state, in Albany County Jail this summer when they brought 300 migrants from the border, it was New York City lawyers who showed up and who helped and who got those individuals out, who got them talking to their kids again, who had been ripped from their necks. It was. It, it all starts here. So let's start thinking about how do we allocate our resources properly. Let's make sure that we're not having arbitrary lines as to who gets services and who doesn't, but let's make sure that the ones who get the free services truly can't afford it. Let's make sure that the ones who can afford it go to private bar, qualified, ethical, you know, vetted private bar. And let's make sure, And but more importantly, we have a whole category of individuals who fall in the middle, more than the 200% of the poverty guidelines, but not enough to afford a private lawyer. We've never had those conversations yet in a real public setting of how do we get to low bono models? How do we get to models that don't only rely on public funds, but do tap into the expertise and the knowledge and the energy of this field? Let's talk about how um, we help the people who never get services, the appeals. That's where you change case law. Look at what Knife Up did when they went to federal court and they got um, a decision on how long the government can actually detain individuals that was seminal. Every single time that you file an appeal, every single time that you challenge a federal action in, in federal court, you're changing the law, but providers can't do that right now. They can't help all of the hundreds if not thousands of New Yorkers who have unjust deportation orders because they went to court and they didn't have good legal representation and now they live with that over, hanging over their heads. Let's make sure that we're funding that. Let's be using technology. Let's look to our neighbors to the north in Canada. The federal government gives province is money for legal services, and in some provinces, they use a voucher system. So that private bar can be brought in through a vetted mechanism to enhance representation, and in Canada, 95% of refugees or asylum seekers are represented through that mechanism. So where else can we learn from? Let's have those conversations. Um, let's figure out how we can network the state so that everything that's <coughs> happening down here can also impact out of state, because when one of our New York City residents gets arrested at the Canadian border, we need somebody out there to help us too. Um, I obviously have already started thinking about a lot of these issues and I look forward to thinking about them more, to using the energy, to, um, to, to talking with the providers um, as to how we can really become an innovative city where we don't not only have the largest investment, but we have the best investment in legal services. And the last thing I wanna say, and I have so much more to say about this, but I know these conversations are only beginning, but I wanna commend you, Chairman, for how much you have done for this. And I really think that in three years, three and a half years, when, when you step off of this chairmanship, we should give you a JD and make you an honorary immigration lawyer for all the work you've done with us in the ranks. I don't think any lawyer in here would approve that. <laughs> <laughs> you've got my hand But I like, uh, uh, maybe I'll go to law school. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll use you better elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. This is a partnership. Absolutely. Thank you. And before, before we leave you, Camille, I want to ask a little bit about the appeals. I think, I think that's, that's incredibly bold and vision about calling out that space. The appeals is where we change the law. Mm -hmm. And Knife Up did it. And I think we, we go back to that often. And so that's connected to the previous conversation about funding lawsuits and appeals can be another piece. And so if, if, if the, uh, the New York Immigration Coalition in partnership with everyone else can come up with what, what does that look like in terms of funding uh, to to think about that flexibility, the f because what we're asking the administration to do is be more flexible, but also be more direct and focused where we need to do that. 
and this could be an area where we can focus some money. Every year, we're going to take on three or four cases that are going to be helpful to change the law. And, and that's not something that we've constructed our programs around. And so if you can help us think about that as a coalition, that would be great, both yeah. on, the, on the lawsuits, but also on the appeals. So one thing that we're working on is collecting better data. And actually, Haslan and I earlier in the back were talking about how we need our New York City track um, and just start doing you know, that sort of systematic FOIA. But uh, beyond that, we're thinking through um, IARC and other mechanisms how to start collecting data so we can really start identifying the, needs, the gaps and the needs. Um, and so that we can make that, that case for that investment. Um, and I think that that falls really particularly well into that. One thing we want to do is start trying to figure out how to engage pro bono and volunteers into filing appeals that push back on all the terrible policies that you heard about today, right? The, do the rapid docketing, the, the inability of judges to make discretionary decisions and all of that. And then how do we start tracking those outcomes and bringing them to federal court? So definitely, I'm, I'm way ahead of you already, but. Looking forward to sitting down then. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Ms. Camille. Thank you very much. My name is Mark Vellinati, and I'm the managing immigration attorney at Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation. Um, I sincerely apologize for any overlap in, on topics that my colleagues have spoken about. Um, for a very brief intro, Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation is a community-based organization founded in 1979. It's grown into a multi-service agency with a staff of over 120 serving New York City with a focus in Upper Manhattan and the Bronx where each of our offices are located. Um, our programs include immigration, housing, financial counseling, health care services, um, education, and career services. Our immigration unit provides consultations and representation primarily on USCIS applications, including humanitarian forms of relief for undocumented clients, such as U visas, VAWAs, and SIG cases. Although we screen and advise clients on a wide range of immigration issues, our ability to provide robust representation before the EOIR is very limited. There are two key aspects of how the lack of funding for nonprofit EOIR representation impacts our own ability to assist our community. The first is when a screen client has an upcoming hearing, lacking the capacity to place one of our own attorneys on a court case that can take years to complete, our current practice is to directly refer the client to a partner organization. However, as has been mentioned several times, other organizations have similar constraints on their capacity, which can prevent a client um, from having the, their case represented. This can result in the client having to appear at least for a hearing or two pro se before immigration judges and increasingly hostile attorney, attorneys from the Department of Homeland Security. Another issue arises in the decision of whether to file certain affirmative cases with USCIS. Up until recently, a relatively narrow set of USCIS application denials would result in a notice to appear at removal proceedings. This June, DHS issued a memo vowing to greatly expand instances where the applicant for immigration benefit will be issued an NTA. This includes, but isn't limited to, applications for adjustment of status, uh, applications to extend or change temporary status, U visa applications for crime victims and domestic violence victims, uh, applications for the abused spouse of a permanent resident or U.S. citizen, and uh, also special immigrant juvenile status applications. This new policy mandates an extra layer of analysis and risk assessment before even deciding to file a case with USCIS for a client who isn't already in removal proceedings. The likelihood of a positive outcome for an application, which can depend on the officer's individual evaluation, is now weighed against the risk of being issued an NTA upon denial and having to fight against deportation. And as with new clients who are already in proceedings, we will have to refer out to other organizations, those summoned to immigration court after the USCIS case is denied. Regardless of the strength of the person's removal defense, without an attorney, the client's chances of success are very limited. As a direct services provider, it is especially disheartening to have to tell a retained client that we must now refer them in the hope that another organization has the capacity to defend them before a judge. Lack of adequate funding to take on more EOIR cases is deeply frustrating and prevents clients, even with viable removal defense cases, from getting the representation they desperately need. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mark, and everything that you're doing at uh, NMIC. And I think one question I just want to ask, are you, are you logging that, the disheartening part where you're telling a retained client, we can't serve you anymore and we're going to move you to another organization. Is that something that you're capturing? 
Well, that last issue regarding um, the expanded list of denials resulting in NTAs, that hasn't hit us yet, thankfully. But you're anticipating But that. we will keep track of it. Great. That's, that's an important part because, again, that's, that's where we're, tr we're trying to figure out what, what happens when a New Yorker set interacts with the city of New York through our service providers and we carry them through the process. And, and I think that's going to be the, one of the textures that we want to present to the administration and say, once, once, once they're in our care, we want that continuum to be, to be fair, just, and fueled with resources. That's, that's the work. That's the, so it would be good to kind of figure out what, what that looks like for you and other organizations. Oh, we'll definitely be keeping track of it. Great. Um, thank you to this panel. And we have one more panel. And that panel is uh, Jojo Annabel, Annabel, Immigrant Justice Corps, uh, Anne Pillsbury, uh, Carol, uh, Carlin Cohen, uh, Persephone Tan, and then Bridget Crawford. So we can get you up up here, and thank you for your patience on this. Uh, I'm really happy that we're. Uh, that we're talking together, and this is this is a known family. All of us having this conversation, so I'm really happy that we're we're doing that together. Here. Uh, and just make sure that you press the button and it turns red. There we go. Um, I'm Ann Pillsbury. I'm the director of Central American Legal Assistance. Um, I started this work over 35 years ago when there were seven judges on the immigration court. And now there are, I think, 34. And I didn't even count the ones at Varick Street. So there's been a huge increase, obviously. And it's continuing. The, Trump administration obviously wants to put as many judges on the court as possible so they can have cases as fast as possible. So we're, we're encountering this kind of dual reality where I was in court this morning with two people and their final hearings are set for 2022. One of my colleagues was in court this morning with, with uh, three-year-old twins and their hearing is in two months. So the new judges have been told to um, accelerate what they call these FAMU cases, F-A-M-U, which we think stands for family unit. And because most of the newly arrived people fleeing out of Central America are, for better or for worse, coming with children, that's a huge segment of the cases that are now going through the immigration courts. And the administration has decided to force these people to have their cases litigated as fast as possible. Their goal seems to be within six months. Now, the law allows people a year to apply for asylum, but the courts are actually shortening that and requiring us to do it even faster. So we're pushing back. It's hard. The new judges are on probation. They're, you know, they're being told by the AG that they have to do this. They're being told by us that it violates due process. And some of them are a little you know, having trouble <laughs> dealing with this, as are we. So, um, but, but it's their discretion, I'm assuming. Well, they're, they're technically it's their discretion. I mean, they, I think, have been told not to exercise discretion. So it's, it's very hard. Um, so anyway, that's, that's what we're up against. Just to give you an idea of the numbers, um, this week our office had 22 hearings scheduled. And we're, we're a staff of about six attorneys, although I think we may have the biggest, one of the biggest um, removal defense caseloads in the city. Um, four final hearings, 19 preliminary hearings. Now, this is not normal. Normally, we have eight to 12 hearings a week. And so we can see the trend is, is obviously shocking. Um, we already are committed to appearing for 193 final hearings representing over 250 people in 2019. Nevertheless, the new judges are scheduling on top of those cases. We have um, large caseloads for final hearings in 2020, 2021, and 2022, years for which we haven't a clue what our funding will be. So obviously, we 
worry about that, but we don't turn down cases because we don't have funding. And when we take cases, we take them all the way up to federal court if, if the uh, case, the facts of the case and the law of the case warrant it. And we get no extra or special dedicated funding for doing appeals, but we just consider it a normal part of representing somebody. So we're very grateful to the council, as everybody is. Um, I'm a little bit of a uh, minority view on the issue of, of uh, universal representation, because when people come across the border, the people from the Northern Triangle, who we are the ones we mostly represent, um, it's asylum or voluntary departure. There really aren't no room for negotiations, and so it's important, we think, to be able to fully staff the as cases that are legitimate asylum cases. And, and let me just follow up with that really quick and say, ask on how, I, I guess I'm not following the, the um, how does universal representation hinder the opportunity for the asylum cases that need to get? Uh, well, because there's only, you know, 40 or 50 hours in the week. And if, if you're going down to court with someone who has no relief except voluntary departure, you're spending hours sitting in court waiting to be called to do something that a person could do without a lawyer. Mm, got it. And so I okay. think we have to be realistic about how we marshal our resources. Yeah, agreed. I, I think it's great to have universal screening, to have everyone mm. talk to a lawyer. Mm -hmm. But representation to me implies you put in your notice of representation and you go to court. Right. And I don't think that that would be a good use of public money. Okay. Thank you for that. And I want to I want to follow up with you later on on the um, I think what what I'm calling the continuum. And so so I think your your comment and feedback can actually fit within a universal model that allows for us to to focus, but allow everyone to have some sense of understanding about what their case is and options. And but you'll still need that. The screening will still be a legal, a legal uh, activity. <laughs> activity. So I, again, I'm thinking like contracts. How do the contracts define it? But a legal screening is is something that a, a legal person will have to do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and we're committed to doing that, and we do it now, yeah, way right. beyond our contract right. commitment. So I think we might not be too far away, um, but I think I, I really hear you when you say, how do we how do we marshal our resources? Uh, and really focus the intensity of an asylum case, which is gonna be intense and uh, a long process. Right. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Anne. Persephone. Hi, thank you, Chairman Chaka and the Committee on Immigration for convening this hearing today. I am Persephone Tan, Associate Director of Immigration and Policy at Asian American Federation. We are an umbrella nonprofit and we have 60 member organizations that are Asian-led and Asian-serving in New York City. Um, and as you may know, 70% uh, of Asian New Yorkers are immigrants, so immigration is a very important issue to us. Um, currently, the Federation receives state funding uh, for serv several immigration programs that we manage and work on with some of our member organizations. And this includes the Navigator Program, Opportunity Centers, and the Liberty Defense Project, which all fall under the purview of the New York State Office for New Americans, or ONA. And we are very thankful for all immigration attorneys and organizations that are here today to testify about the importance of their very crucial work that's needed for uh, the immigrant community living in New York. Um, and without them, the fight against the president's xenophobic laws and policies would be very hard to overcome. And my main point in testifying today on behalf of the Federation is to emphasize um, when we talk about the need for legal representation, we really need to think about the role of community-based organizations um, because they are the link between the immigrant communities and to legal service organizations, especially when the legal service organizations do not have the language capacity to speak to the immigrants directly. And specifically for the Asian immigrant community, our CBOs are the vital connections. They're on the ground and they're trusted organizations where clients go to when they have an issue. And so we are asking for um, investments in both CBOs and legal service organizations when you're considering funding for immigrant legal services. Um, a lot of the work that our member orgs do is unrecognized labor um, that they have to deal with. So, you know, when a client's seeking legal immigration services, it's much easier to find 
an attorney who speaks Spanish, for example. It is much, much harder to find a Nepalese or Arabic-speaking attorney. So the reliance on these CBOs, very local CBOs, who speak multiple dialects of Asian languages is very crucial in that formula to make sure that the client gets access to legal immigration services. So when we think about the capacity building for these CBOs, we really need to make sure that there is a partnership between legal service organizations and the CBOs who have direct access to these immigrants. Can't really provide legal immigration services if you don't even have that connection, right? When you, uh, I've heard stories of making um, a referral uh, to a legal service organization, but that legal service organization still has to rely on that CBO for translation services, for interpretation, for them uh, telling the clients, you know, you need to bring these certain documents, making those appointments. So it's a lot of free work that they're doing, case management work that they're doing that is very critical um, to immigrant legal services. Thank you. And I want to ask, uh, HRA, is HRA in the room? Can you raise your hand? Thank you. Uh, Moya, Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, thank you. Awesome. So they're here and they heard that. I heard. I hope that you feel um, confident both uh, Councilmember Drum and I are really kind of focused on this concept of the, the kind of wraparound resources that really think about uh, English language learners as they access services. The legal services are probably the more critical ones because they're difficult to understand, period. Uh, and, and so it's not just about having translation. And I think you're, to your point, the people who understand the law in a way to be able to communicate it correctly, uh, and, and that's, that's a robust need that requires people, and that's a whole other budget line that, that we have yet to find common ground with the administration right now on. Uh, and, and so we wanna work with you to figure out how, how, we, how we address that, and whether it's, it's, it's building robust nonprofit language services and translation services, or, or it's a whole other team that is just dedicated to, to language services. And the last, uh, this last election, the three different proposals uh, they, a few of them really spoke to bringing those language services within the community boards, and so we're going to be pulling that out in the budget uh, negotiations about how we how we make sure that every service has has no barriers to um, to access related to language. Period. So thank you, thank you for that to that voice. Good afternoon, my name is Carlin Cowan. I'm the Chief Policy and Public Affairs Officer of the Chinese American Planning Council. We are a proud member of Asian American Federation and one of the CBOs that Persephone was describing. So I would really like to uplift the recommendations that she shared, but also describe a little bit of what we see on the ground at CPC in our three community centers, um, where we work with over 60,000 Asian American immigrant and low-income New Yorkers on a variety of services every year. We see community members that speak 25 different languages and the need for legal services has exploded over the past couple of years. Um, because we don't have a robust in-house legal service or legal partnerships, what happens is we really end up piecing together legal services from a variety of partners like NILAG and like IJC. And what happens is sometimes there are linguistically appropriate legal services, but because we're talking 25 different languages, a lot of times what happens is that our staff end up doing the translating, especially when services are then being referred out after initial screenings. And our staff members are already overloaded with their other work, but are also not experts. And so that goes to what you were talking about, about the nuances of translation when it comes to these really detailed issues. So not only are our staff taking on extra labor that is unfunded, but they're not necessarily the best people to do it. It would be best if we could provide legal services directly in the language. Another thing that we see that's a huge issue is because there's such a lack of legal services in the Asian American community is that a lot of our community members turn to uh, less reputable sources, similar to uh, notarios in, this, in the Latino community, for legal services, and then they're actually coming to our community centers for second opinions when they've already been told to, for example, apply for asylum in a case where they weren't actually eligible for asylum, or their broker has somehow frauded them. And when they get to us at that point, because they've already gone through that, 
there's actually very little that our legal services can do to support them, and it puts them in a set of proceedings unnecessarily that could have been avoided if we'd had more robust legal services that were linguistically and culturally appropriate to begin with. So just in conclusion, I'd really like to share the recommendations that Persephone shared, making sure that we have good integration between community-based organizations that have the language and cultural understanding, as well as trust with community members and the legal services that have been sharing so many important points about the work that they do today. Thank you. Can I uh, ask that uh, we want to be creative right now and think about whether or not there's an, um, uh, an API initiative that can be focused, uh, and I'm not saying this is the only community that needs it, but your, your need is very specific, mm -hmm. and if you can build an initiative that allows us to kind of look at, at building out what, what you need, and I, what I don't want to do is, is create that for you and with your partners, uh, whether that's building out a legal arm for CPC or other organizations, or, or kind of building a relationship that's what's singular, and again, I'm actually I'm not I'm I'm doing what I said I wasn't going to do. Figure out what you need, and and then let us know. And I think that's where we need to start, from from your from your experience on the ground with your organizations to address the language barrier um, and the unfunded labor that's currently going on right now. That's not there's no efficacy at the end of the day, uh, and it's it, uh, that's unacceptable. So let's figure out how we can really address that from your perspective. Absolutely, I think that's a okay. huge need for us and other organizations that work with the Asian American community and we'd be happy to talk about that more. Good, thank you. Thank you. Chairman Jaka, um, good afternoon and thank you so much for inviting me to uh, speak today. Um, you've asked a lot of thought-provoking questions this afternoon and it's interesting that I have answers to some of them. Um, I think that what you heard today is how legal service providers and activists are drinking out of a fire hose um, because of what is happening here. The only thing that keeps us all going are the stories of resiliency and the stories from our clients who've seen so much, uh, keeps us going. But to answer some of the questions that you, you answered, so four years ago, we made the largest infusion of immigration talent into this, this, uh, into the city. 25 recent law graduates, very committed to social justice, who came in and infused legal service provider organizations with energy and took on so many cases. I'm proud to say that 96% of them have stayed in the immigration field since they graduated. We currently, we graduated another 25 in August, 96% have stayed in the immigration field. You're talking about capacity. We are graduating folks who want to do this. Folks are coming from California because there's no immigrant justice call. There's no way to get their foot through the door, coming to New York to learn and going back. If you're talking about capacity, we are building a pipeline. Our footprints are all over the legal service providers in the city. They, have, they take on our staff sometimes 18 months into the fellowship. They are hiring them which means that we're doing something good. We are, we are bringing real talent into the city. Um, we are also trying different delivery models. We are capacity building. We are not only dealing with the reputable organizations, we're building capacity. We've built capacity at Arab American Association in New York City. We've built capacity at Ming Kwan. We've built capacity uh, at South Yetu, which uh, works with African women. We've provided them with lawyers. The fellows we are bringing in are immigrants or first generation immigrants. They speak multiple languages. We are not bringing folks in where organizations also need to hire translators for them. We can do a lot. The model we have, especially with our college graduates who are embedded in all five boroughs, they are all, we, 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 are, we are working out of libraries these are folks who we have first years and second years, we've paired them. You talk about supervision. After a year, our second year committee fellow is able to supervise a first year with little supervision from an attorney, right? Even though we need that oversight. We've built enough that our fellows who started this program are currently supervisors at organizations. 
all because of the staff development we put in. We have a lot to offer. We, our numbers have remained stagnant, but we are ready to add more people. I have 60 recent law graduates or law, uh, law students who are about to graduate who are vying for 25 spots. I wish I could give all of them those spots. But we are at the precipice of being able to do this. We want to work with you to make sure this can happen. Uh, we can build that pipeline for you if you give us a chance. And, uh, we and by chance, we, do we mean money? Well, money is a factor, right? Because yeah. most of the so work- That's what I want to understand. What, yes. what, what is that, that pipeline? Because you're right. I think you're, you're answering a lot of the questions, actually, of, of the kind of need for uh, lawyers that speak multiple languages. And you know I love the, the justice court. It's incredible. And, and the idea that, that lawyers are coming from other states to, to do the work here through the fellowship is really exciting. Uh, and and figuring out how we take it to the next level for the pipeline to be larger, how do we do that? So we, we, we do that, so a lot of our funding, 70% to 80% of, of our funding is from foundations and individuals, right? And we can't continue to rely, rely on foundations, right? And so we have to diversify our funding streams. Yes, thank you so much. You give us some money to do U visas, you give us some money to do other things. But all we are saying is that if we are talking about capacity and we are bringing these folks, these fellow young lawyers in and training them, we can train them to build that. Build them at if the community-based level. We are talking about Chinese Planning Council. We have two fellows there. We've had fellows there for the past three years. Is it a matter of adding a lawyer? We could do that if we are going to get the funding to, to, to be able to place someone there, right? But and, I and think the funding right now, relationship is funding for caseload. Mm -hmm. And that's, you're saying that's good and that's okay. Uh, and the diversification is more about expanding caseload, paying for caseload through the Justice Corps. Yes. Because I, I think you're investing. Okay. I, I think you, you, when you talk about money, you should look at it in terms of investment, an investment in the career of a young lawyer, an investment in the lives of immigrants that they're going to work with. That's too, too and I wonder, you know, de Blasio wants to create 100,000 jobs mm -hmm. in the city of New York, and I wonder if he's capturing this number and whether or not we can redefine that 100,000 jobs with lawyers that we can help uh, and, and, and bring into, into the field. Exactly. And my last, question, my, my, last, my last point also is, is that we are also looking, and I think we should all look at this because you've talked about universal representation, right? Universal representation is on different levels. We should really look at how college graduates who come in and be basically accredited reps, partial, can become full accredited reps at some point and be able to do some of the work that is in, being done in court. We should look at that. We've talked about low bono. We've just started opening a low bono practice in Jersey City. We are trying that model. We are bringing in fellows who are interested in going into the private sector, but who want to be able to do that charging low fees. We just started this in October. So we are trying different le uh, delivery models, and we will really want to talk to uh, the city about some of these things because we've tried them, we've seen that they've been successful, and we can build on it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really helpful. Jojo, and keep doing the good work. Well, let's keep doing it together. Thank you so much. Last but n hopefully not least, um, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. My name is Bridget Crawford, and I'm the legal director for Immigration Equality. Um, immigration Equality is one of the leading LGBTQ immigrant rights organizations in the country. And since 1994, we've advocated for and represented thousands of LGBTQ and HIV positive immigrants. Um, I will try not to be too repetitive. I'll say that um, we echo many of the sen uh, sentiments of the other organizations that have already testified, but in nearly 80 countries, it's a crime to be LGBTQ. Um, many more countries are fundamentally unsafe for our population. Many of our clients have faced the most horrific persecution imaginable, and our clients flood to New York City in search of a life that they cannot have anywhere else. But when they reach U the United States, as many of the other organizations have pointed out, um, they are often met with near insurmountable obstacles when interacting with our immigration system. Um, 
I won't repeat some of the issues that have come up as of late under the Trump administration. I think in particular the quota systems um, and the lack of access to due process for our clients in immigration proceedings are problematic. Um, I think the, the situation is particularly dire for LGBTQ and HIV positive immigra immigrants in immigration court. We regularly find that judges require additional briefing and education in order to make fair decisions on an LGBTQ person's case. For example, judges are often unfamiliar with transgender identity. They conflate it with a person being gay, wrongly finding that, for example, a transgender woman does not qualify for asylum because it is relatively safe for a gay man in her country of origin. Um, this is simply wrong, and it puts our clients at grave risk. The Obama administration had um, planned to address such issues with LGBTQ um, competency trainings for immigration judges, similar to what our organization does for asylum and refugee officers. However, no such trainings have taken place, and um, we don't see that happening in the near future. And I think it's uh, extremely challenging for experienced counsel to be able to convey these important concepts to judges under time constraints. It is nearly impossible for a lot of pro se litigants, especially English language learners who do not know the law, may not have the vocabulary to explain these nuances, especially in an adversarial proceeding. For those LGBTQ and HIV positive immigrants in detention, justice is regularly denied. Involuntary transfers to open beds rip New Yorkers away from their communities, their families, and their attorneys. For LGBTQ and HIV positive immigrants, detention is exceptionally dangerous. A, re a recent study by the Center for American Progress found that LGBTQ people in immigration detention are 97% more likely to experience sexual assault in detention than non-LGBTQ people. And in our experience, this bears out Roughly half of our transgender clients who have been in immigration detention report physical and sexual and or sexual violence. In short, <laughs> legal representation is more critical than ever now. Um, an asylum seeker is five times more likely to win her case if she's represented by an attorney. Having an attorney raises the um, asylum seeker's odds by a thousand percent. We know this is true. We uh, regularly win cases, we have a 99% success rate, but unfortunately we cannot meet the need. We've seen a significant uptick in the number of um, LGBTQ and HIV positive immigrants that are calling our hotline, that are reaching out to us through web inquiries, and we just cannot meet the need right now. Um, with additional support and funding, we're hoping that we can expand the services that we provide and meet more of the need, but I think as everyone else has voiced, the floodgates have opened and, um, and everybody is, is desperately trying to help the most vulnerable population. Thank you, Bridget, for your, your testimony and the work that you do uh, at Immigration Equality and the people that you serve are um, uh, important to not just me, but the speaker as well. And so this is how, um, this is how we get there, by understanding the need. And so it's really important to understand the, uh, the kind of um, impact that uh, a LGBTQ gender nonconforming person is going through the court system and tension. It's important to, to hear these, these voices. Um, and it, it just accelerates the need for us to work together to figure out what you need as an organization and what the whole system needs. And so what, what I wanna do and end, end here um, is say that you know we started we started this uh, hearing with with some big topic items and the the topic here was how do we get to a place where everyone who needs a lawyer who needs a lawyer you're right and who needs a, no, a lawyer can get a lawyer and and live with dignity and respect the system um, that due process is the the goal that a court system can offer justice to the person that's going to a judge. And it is getting plagued with so much political um, forces, negative, evil uh, uh, policies that support white supremacy and a 
a whitening of America, and that is what we are we are dealing with. And the deportation machine is an is a is an active tool to remove people from our communities. And you all represent people that deserve to be here and deserve the dignity of an immigration reform plan that allows them to create status, to stay here, to work here, to be here, to live here, to love here. Uh, and that is, that is our goal. Now, the federal government refuses to acknowledge this ability to have legal representation, and we're not there yet. But we gotta create it first. And that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the goal here, because we can. We can create it. And there's nothing removing us from that except for political leadership. And you all hold us to that fire, and we, he and we feel it, and so we're gonna keep pushing for that. And while we do that, we're gonna get the state to do it, and then we're, found, we're, we're soon gonna get the federal government because Congress will turn, it's already turning. All the women who have been elected uh, from communities that represent the kind of values that we're talking about here will continue to grow. And so that's the vision that we hear, that we see already, and that's what we're, we're feeling right now. And the burden on us is to get it right here in the city of New York, because that is our world. That's what we can do and, and impact the rest of the nation. And so thank you for your work, your diligent work, uh, your thoughtful work, and your feedback to us. And so all these initiatives, I'm hoping we can really follow through and come back with a real robust budget request and some legislation that really defines our actual commitment to representation that, that is universal in terms of getting lawyers to people who need it. And, and that, that, is, that is our work. And, and I think what, what's really beautiful too, and what I'm hearing is all these different pieces, like a justice core that's training the next generation, um, look like the people that they're serving. And that, that's, the, that's the, the, the beauty of a system when a government can represent, be represented by the people that they're serving. That, that, is, that is the goal here, and that's what we're gonna get to. Um, and whether I go to, uh, to law school or not, it'll be something <laughs> else. We can talk about Camille. Uh, you're saying no, you're saying no, but uh, this might be my next, my next uh, avenue for, for work. But I wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart, and this is just the beginning. It's the end of 2018, uh, but next year we're gonna come out fighting for the things that we need in this next budget, and you're gonna be there to support us. Thank you, thank you. And now this meeting is adjourned, and I wanna thank, thank you to the HRA team and Moya for being here as well. Thank you.